Okay, you can begin your meeting, Alderman Bocaro. Okay, we'll call the Art of the uh, Public Safety Committee hearing, Madam Clerk. Please call the roll. <laughs> uh, Alderman Boyd. Okay. Well, Mr. Clerk. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> well, I didn't Alderman know if it was. Alderman Davis? Present. Alderman Howard? Present. Alderman Spencer? Present. Alderman Pamboy? Present. Alderman Bosley? He's, a, he's in the streets meeting. He's still in the streets. Alderman Muhammad? Alderman Odenberg? I believe he's still in the streets. No, he's here now. Oh, there he is. Present. Mm -hmm. Alderman Narayan? Present. Alderman Clark Hubbard? Here. Alderman Page? Present. Chairman Vaccaro? Present. Alderman Boyd? He, he's definitely in the other meeting. I could see him on the okay. screen. Alderman Bosley? Alderman he's Muhammad? Still you have nine present, a quorum is present. Okay. Um, so I'm looking for approval of the minutes from the Tuesday, June 10th meeting. So uh, moved. Who made second. the motion? Uh, all the women hard made the motion. Who made the second? Second. 24. Uh, Alderman Alderman Ryan made the uh, second. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. <laughs> Alderman Boyd. Alderman Davis? Aye. Alderman Howard? Aye. Alderman Spencer? Alderman Pam Boyd? Aye. Aye. Alderman Bosley? Alderman Muhammad? Alderman Odenberg? Aye. Alderman Narayan? Aye. Page. Aye. Alderman Vaccaro. Aye. Alderman Boyd. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Bosley. Alderman Muhammad. You have eight aye votes. Okay, well, that's good. So, what we're going to do, uh, we've approved the minutes. What we're going to do. I'm going to let the speaker speak first, and then we're going to come back around. Um, I'm not really going to limit them in time because they actually all four have, uh, you know, or either with the public safety director's office or Jeff Hines. And I think I'll start with, with Jeff first. He is with the Carpenters Union. He represents the workers. And then we'll go to uh, Commissioner Isom and our, our public safety director, Ison, I'm sorry. And then to uh, uh, Mr. Clarkson, I don't know if I see you, but I hope you're there. And then Heather Taylor. So uh, Jeff, if you wanna go ahead and, and, and kind of give us what's on your mind. And I would ask uh, either if uh, Alderwoman uh, Davis or Howard, since I might be having to jump across Either one of you want to volunteer to chair this in case I'm not here? I'll be listening the whole time. That's fine. I'll help. Okay. So if I, I'm going to kind of be listening to streets and, but uh, if we can go to the speakers, I will be here. I'll be listening, but in case I'm not all the way in, if I'm voting on the other side. So, uh, so, so in the order, we got uh, Jeff Hines and Dan Isom. Uh, Jeffrey Carson, and then Heather Taylor. So, uh, Jeff, you're up. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Vaccaro and members of the Public Safety Committee <clears throat> for this opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Jeff Hans. I'm a resident for over 20 years in the 13th Ward. I am also a business rep for the St. Louis, Kansas City Carpenters Regional Council. 
who represent numerous employees in various departments within the city. Today, I'm here to be the voice and the advocate for the correctional officers, which of course are also city residents. Correctional officers are extremely important to public safety as there are COs on duty 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They work through the pandemic without uh, raising any hazard pay, not even any accolades or positive press. Correctional officers keep not only us safe, but the detainees from the unruly detainees. But it has become extremely difficult during the current conditions at CJC. Numerous officers have resigned, retired, or transferred out of fear for their own safety, or they simply could not afford the parking issues that exist downtown, especially during special events. Even with MSI staff being going to CJC, they will still be extremely short staffed, which is dangerous. CJC is probably going to be down at least two housing units for approximately a year due to the repairs caused by the riots, the doors, the locks, the control panels. I've heard rumors that housing unit officers will be relying on master control to open up the cell doors in the housing units via radio. These radios have not been, uh, they've been very unreliable over the last several years for various reasons. So I think this is a, unsafe situation to put the officers in and or the detainees. One of the reasons given for the riot on, over on Easter was overcrowding. Yet here we are rushing to close MSI, which will then force an overcrowding situation in the very same building that is not prepared to do so. The intent is to transfer the remaining 52 off, excuse me, the remaining 52 inmates to CJC this Thursday. This is terrifying, considering several housing units still have malfunctioning door locks and have yet to be repaired. We were extremely lucky. The first two incidents that nobody was either seriously injured or killed. Will we be that fortunate the third time? I realize it is the will to close the workhouse. I'm not trying to convince you anything differently, but I am begging and pleading with this <clears throat> legislative body to demand a pause on the closure of MSI until CJC is actually fully functional and safe for our citizens to be detained. Thank you. That's all I have. Does he have any questions for me? Joe, are you still on or did you leave? <clears throat> I'm, I'm listening. I'm sorry. But if you can just go down the, the list is. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I would say if. Um, uh, public safety director, Dan, Dan Isom, uh, if you could go ahead and speak on this. I know I'm going to have a bunch of questions. Okay. So uh, but do you know if. If on, that's on, a policy on, that was approved uh, by the parking If you can just speak on it, then we'll go, we'll just go down the list. I'm sorry. Now, mute your box. What, um, what's that? Mute. We can get right. feedback. I can see your first point about I'm, I'm, Let me turn this one down. I'm sorry. What was that again? Okay. That? Joe, I'm not clear. Did you want to have people commenting now and asking Jeff questions, or do you want to let all the speakers speak? Oh, and oh yeah. No, that, that's questions. fine. You know what? Yeah. I'm sorry. If you could, I'm all the women. I'm gonna let you chair this at least for a little while because I'm interested in what's happening and I think I'm up to speak next. Okay. Um, okay. So go ahead and yes, um, I, I I would say if you could chair this for a bit, I would appreciate. Late it. Penalties. Okay, I'm gonna go through the if list. The and those of you that have questions, of Mr. Hans may do so at this time. Okay. Um, Alderman Davis, Alderwoman Davis. No questions, thank you. Okay. Uh, Alderwoman Spencer. Uh, I don't have any questions. I Jeff, thanks for coming before us. Um, well, I guess I, I would just like a little bit of clarification. When you talk about a pause, can you help uh, help us understand um, 
what, you know, from the perspective of the employees, uh, what actions, what things we need to take care of, you know, what sort of things need to take place during that pause uh, to make the employees uh, comfortable moving forward? I know the control panels are a serious concern um, because you have to rely on two people in master control to be able to pop those doors. And that could be a, a dangerous situation, especially if the radio didn't react in time or um, I just think it's best if we just wait until everything is ready to be functional. I mean, I don't think that's a lot to ask. I know the intent is to close it. There are unforeseen circumstances that happen um, that have caused damage to those facilities. Until that's repaired, I, I think we're moving way too fast. And I think all my officers would appreciate having a safe environment. I know I would on their behalf. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, you know, I've been one of the biggest supporters of closing the workhouse um, over the last year. And, and when these unforeseen circumstances came to light, I, I share your concerns about, um, about that, those closures. Um, can you talk just a little bit about the parking? Uh, has uh, validated parking been refused for these employees or, you know, has there been any uh, attempt to compensate or kind of accommodate uh, a change, a major change in expenses for these folks? Um, several years now, we, we have tried to negotiate that in the pay ordinance or at any point, really. And we've always been denied either from the treasurer's office or city hall itself. Um, the problem is second and third shift have an unreasonable expectation to pay increased parking rates because of special events at either the Blues, the Cardinals, or anything else that's going on. All of a sudden, all the parking goes up and they're not allowed to park where they were parking fairly cheaply. Um, we actually tried to get the fifth floor, the, the top is uh, the very next garage to the CJC to reserve it just for correctional officers, but that was always denied. Um, so that's one of the reasons why a lot of them don't want to go downtown is there'll be a serious pay cut to them. And then, of course, the conditions scare the hell out of them as well. OK, uh, thanks, Jeff. I, that, that's all the questions Thank I you. have right now. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Alder, Alder woman Boyd. Jeff, the question that I'm having is I'm hearing it's a it's a challenge for the staff because you don't have the staff, correct? It's my understanding, even with MSI going there, and that's just at the contingency at the end of the month, at the end of May, that they still need about 25 to 30 officers short. Okay. Um, so they won't have the contingency at CJC. And then of course, we're gonna be packing people in and not being able to use two housing units at a time while they're being repaired. Seems like a dangerous situation. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is Alderman Bosley on? I don't believe so. Mm. Uh, Alderman Collins Muhammad. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Alderwoman. Uh, I have a lot of concerns about this, uh, but I will reserve my questions to the end. I want to hear. Uh, I want to continue to hear from the other speakers uh, as well. Thank you, uh, Alderwoman. Okay. Alderman Oldenburg. Do you have any questions, Alderman Bo Oldenburg? Okay, I, I guess he's not on. <clears throat> Alderman Narayan. Thank you, uh, Ms. Vice Chair. Uh, and how are you, Jeff? Afternoon, sir. Um, so just a couple of questions for you. So at any given time, how many how many officers are we talking about? I'm, I'm just thinking about this parking concern. Um, I don't really know the breakdown per shift. I do believe that the contingency for CJC is 198 CO1s and 35 CO2s, which are lieutenants. How that's broken down to shifts, I'm sure varies. There's probably more on the first and second shift than there are on the third, but I do not know those numbers. I just know I've received numerous complaints over the years regarding the parking situation during special okay. events, particularly. Okay, and do you, do you uh, have any understanding of how long it would take to uh, 
to repair those control panels and, uh, and, and, and locks and things of that nature that uh, your guys are concerned about? I, I believe that the coronavirus is being blamed for the delays, of course. I mean, um, I don't know a specific number. I've just heard rumors that it could take up to a year, which is very concerning, um, especially when people know how to pop these locks. It's become common knowledge. Um, I know the officers are being mm -hmm. trained in order to identify that more often and keep track of that, but does that really keep everybody safe without an unoperable lock? It just seems crazy to me that we would even consider it. Sure, sure. Um, well, that's really all I have. Uh, thank you for, for coming. Thank you, sir. Good seeing you. You too. Alderwoman Clark Hubbard, do you have any questions for Mr. Hunts? Alderman Clark Hubbard, Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. I don't, okay, I don't see. This time. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Alderman James Page. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have no questions at this time. I am waiting for an opportunity to hear the balance of the speakers. Okay. Um, and Mr. Hans, I have a question. How many um, officers do you know at this time have, have reported injuries in the uprising that took place Easter? And um, I don't do think there were any injuries to officers okay, during that good. time. That's, that's why we were blessed. I, I just, right. you know, two have happened. I, I have all the faith in Mr. Carson and he's going to make sure it doesn't happen, but some of these people are unpredictable, you know? Right, right. Okay, well, I, I think that, you know, both the safety of our correctional officers and our inmates is, is utmost here. Uh, we sure, you know, people may be accused of a crime, but we sure don't want them suffering injuries while they're under our purview. And uh, I think it's a serious consider. Is there anybody else on the line that did not get called on or would like to ask questions at this time? Okay, we'll move on. And uh, Thank at you. this time, okay, are you going to stay tuned in? I will. I'll just unmute myself. Okay, okay. that's fine. Um, Dr. Isom, uh, at this time, would you like to speak to the closure of the uh, workhouse MSI? and what the plan is uh, to provide safety for everyone. Yes, uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with Jeff that, um, you know, this is a 24-7 a operation, that um, COs are very important to our mission. And, you know, we are concerned about both the safety of detainees and correctional officers. Um, certainly this is, uh, always challenging to have change, and this is radical change, but um, it's something that uh, the community has wanted for years, and um, we are uh, setting that plan in motion. So I, I wanna talk first about um, one issue, and that is overcrowding, uh, because that seems to be something that people um, are concerned about, and of course we are as well. So currently, there are uh, 51 detainees that still remain at MSI uh, as of this morning. Um, so, um, and then in the Justice Center, currently we have uh, 524 detainees. Um, we have the capacity for that 524 um, and um, uh, we will be moving towards uh, removing those remaining 51 into the Justice Center. Um, we are working and we will continue to work with all of our partners, whether it's the court or the circuit attorney's office, um, the federal system to manage the number of detainees uh, in the Justice Center um, so we can um, sufficiently deal with capacity. So as we speak today, um, we have the capacity to deal with the detainees that are there. Um, and uh, we don't have detainees sleeping on the floor. Um, they are uh, in their proper uh, facilities. 
and uh, being managed with the number of people we have now. So uh, as we stand today, um, we have the capacity um, to, to manage um, the number of detainees we have in the facility. And we're moving towards uh, the remaining 51 uh, moving into the facility. And we will continue to try to lower uh, the number uh, where reasonable, um, whether it be moving to um, other facilities, uh, meaning federal facilities or um, other municipalities um, that are responsible for their own detainees. In terms of staffing, uh, as, as Jeff mentioned, um, staffing um, will be uh, better when we combine the two facilities. I just went over there today um, and uh, uh, Commissioner Carson, I think Commissioner Carson will speak of this. We are uh, merging uh, the staffing of both facilities. Um, previous to this, um, we were extremely, extremely short staffed at MSI uh, compared to the number of detainees that we had there. Um, and now combining them, although we won't be at full strength, we will be um, much more capable um, in terms of a staffing level by combining um, both staffs into one facility as opposed to trying to manage two facilities um, when um, we really don't have the capacity and the number of detainees that would necessitate two facilities at the same time. Um, in terms of repairs, um, as Jeff indicated, the repairs will be ongoing. Um, we will have two pods down um, until we are able to um, you know, fix um, you know, all units. And we're doing a, a, a massive sort of redesign but with that being said, we do have the capacity um, right now to be able to uh, appropriately house individuals um, even with uh, two units being down. And so we are working through that, that process. So um, what I would say as we speak today is that we're not overcrowded. The staffing situation is going to be better by having one facility and uh, we are appropriately dealing with the repairs. Um, one issue that Jeff brings up in, in terms of locks, the same locks that are at the Justice Center are the locks that are at uh, MSI. Um, so we are repairing the locks at the Justice Center. We have not repaired the locks at MSI, as I said, which are the same locks, locking mechanisms that are at CJC. So um, that, is um, my report and I will um, open up any questions anybody might have. Joe? It's another meeting. I mean, okay, so he texted me I, that he was back. I yeah, I'm back. I clicked out of the other meeting because I, I have so many questions myself, one of which Mr. Carson made it clear at the last meeting, people are sleeping on the floor, that people are sleeping on benches. What miracle took place? That now everybody's got plenty of space or is Mr. Carson just not a very truthful person or has his job been threatened? So he'll say whatever he's told to say. And I don't mean to be blunt, but it's confusing to me that two weeks ago, it, se it seems like even with this uh, game of, well, we're closing the workhouse, we're really not closing the workhouse. We're going to call it the uh, CJC Annex, and I assume that's so that because the funding's been cut off to the workhouse, I assume that's so you can funnel money from CJC into MSI to keep it open. So I, these are my quite what miracle took place in the, since the meeting last week that now people are not on benches, people are not being shipped, shoot all the way to the far northest part of the state and you can ship somebody. Um, or, or, I mean, I, I'm curious and, I, and I'm certainly gonna have a lot of questions for Mr. Carson too, that what miracles took place over at CJC or the downtown jail, that all of a sudden now people are not sleeping on the floor. They're not, you know, so, so anyway, uh, uh, Public Safety Director Isom. 
you know, well, I'm not sure what miracle occurred. Um, this is an ongoing process where we are managing the merging of two facilities. Um, the amount of people, whether we had MSI or CJC, um, fluctuates over time. Um, the holding tank that holds temporary people, whether it be for probation and parole or other uh, municipalities where people are waiting to be picked up, um, that that portion of the area um, ebbs and flows from time to time. Um, and that is irrespective of whether we have MSI or not. So what miracle occurred, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but um, I'm reporting what um, we have as of today. Uh, and I'm talking to, and I'll ask Mr. Carson the same, because we can play back his commentary from the last meeting. The last meeting, he told us, there are no room for boats or anything, that people are sleeping on the floor, they're sleeping on benches, that he's getting on an average of five or six calls or more every day of people complaining that are in there about the conditions, that even while we were in the meeting, he said he received six calls. So, I mean, I'll, I'll wait to ask him the same questions. Something, okay. Something's happened. Either he's decided he likes his job or something, but, uh, you know, his, his, his testimony last week was very critical and of, of, of closing that. And, and I, I certainly believe overcrowding, putting people on the floors, putting people in a building where the windows are boarded up, putting where there's no locks is very unsafe. I'm going to, I'm going to go down the committee because, and then I, I'm going to ask the same questions again, only because so, some miracle took place between five days ago and now. We have the staff now. It's not overcrowded. Uh, you know, it, it just doesn't seem, something seems wrong. Uh, let me go down the list. Vice Chairman Boyd. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my, my first question is, um, Dr. Eisen, you made a statement. Other you, you look, you guys were looking at other municipalities that are responsible for their own detainees. I mean, explain what did you mean by that statement? Moving people toward other municipalities that are responsible for their detainees. Yes, uh, Alderman Boyd. Um, as you might imagine, when St. Louis police officers make an arrest, um, sometimes it could be from our jurisdiction, or it could be from other jurisdictions. And, you know, those, there are a number of arrests that occur like that. Um, they could be um, probation violations. They could be parole violations. There could be someone wanting to St. Louis County, um, even further municipalities out from that could be even a, a federal charge. Um, those are uh, detainees that are awaiting um, pickup from other jurisdictions. Um, and so oftentimes those are held in a temporary location awaiting uh, those jurisdictions to pick up. Um, technically, you know, they are not uh, St. Louis city detainees. And the, the place that, um, you know, uh, Carson was referring to is that area um, where often people are held, sometimes longer than we would want them to be held uh, because, um, you know, these different municipalities will not pick them up uh, on in a timely manner. So that's the portion that he was talking about. Um, at least I think that's what Carson was referring to in the previous testimony. Okay, um, so let's talk about the repairs. So there's one floor, is it one floor or two that's in need of repair due to the locks? Right, so the, the process is, um, that we believe we want to do is um, take two units offline and do complete repairs for all that needs to be done in those two units and move unit by unit uh, to do that. We believe we have uh, the capacity to do that, but just to take one offline and do everything. As you all know, um, you know, there hasn't been significant um, update 
in this facility for many years. So we want to do everything we can in one pod or two pods at a time, take down and uh, do those repairs and move uh, from pod to pod. Now, we say pod, because, I, I, you know, all this talk in the media is about floors. The third floor was where the breakout happened because uh, the locks. So how many pods on the third floor? Uh, there are four. Four. So all four pods are offline right now. Is that correct? No, we have two that are offline. Okay. So the other two, there's repairs have been made to the lock. Um, yes. The repairs have been made to the locks on the other two pods, yes. Okay. And it's my understanding, and I, maybe I need to come over to the Justice Center soon because I don't re remember what it's been so long ago that I went through there. Um, so if you take, so if you have two pods offline, how many people typically would two pods house? Um, it could house a total of 132. 132. And right now you said we have 500 and something? Yeah, so right now we have 524. And the total capacity is how much for that building? Uh, total capacity for um, CJC, the total capacity is 860. But in terms of, um, you know, rated capacity, um, 719. Seven and, and that's and you say rated capacity because you have to separate um, females from the males and there's there's a lot of moving parts to um, to that number right it's not a absolute, yeah not absolute basically yeah it's not an absolute but uh, I'll I'll let Carson explain that but eight sixty is the total capacity and I'll let him explain the breakdown to you okay I'm listening. Mr. Carson. So, so if, if everything is right, everybody has a roommate, every cell is fixed, every tank is fixed, we can temporarily put 860 people somewhere. That will be sheriff's tanks, everything. And so, so the sheriff's tanks uh, for people going court, but if we had to put that many people in there, temporarily. Uh, it is recommended that you never reach your maximum capacity more than eight hours. Um, why? Because tanks are just tanks with a bench in it. In most jails, if you go to other jails, it's called open seating. Right. Open seating is just a bench that people sit on until you decide where they're going to go. Unfortunately, uh, some people may sit on that bench for quite a long time. So the 860 is total capacity for the entire jail. The rated capacity are sales, different types of sales. Now, um, I'm, I'm gonna try to uh, fix this, but I talked to uh, Tammy, I said, well, most of the media think that we have 719 beds. We don't have 719 beds. Oh. Here, here's how that, how that breaks down. How it breaks down is we have two pods that are being repaired. That's 130 beds, so you have to subtract that. So 130 from 130 from 132 from that number is 589 somewhere around there. Um, and then you have to consider that that in, uh, CJC is certified to have juveniles. So you have um, you have three 17 year olds two 15 year olds and one 16 year old. Those individuals cannot be housed with anyone else by sight and sound, that's the state law. So those individuals, even if you had 66 sales, you can't put anybody else in that unit. So it kind of takes the capacity down. Oh and and this, is, this is accurate number. So I just got this number today from Tammy. So we have uh, three 17 year olds, one 16 year old and two 15 year olds. So those are juveniles. They have to be separated by sight and sound. Then you have females, which um, the last time we had females in a unit, which there was at, at the time I spoke uh, last week or so, 
it was 19 females, now there are 25. So we moved the females out of a sale that, uh, out of the area that had 66 sales, because you can't put anybody else in there, and I moved them to a smaller area. Uh, Dr. Isom, um, uh, uh, Ms. Smith, and uh, I mean, uh, Heather uh, uh, Taylor and I walked around and, and, and we tried to look at those parole violators um, and people that had been in the tank for a long time and we put those people in sales. I did that personally. I went down to the tanks. Uh, we found out who was there the longest, who was there the shortest amount of time and put those people inside sales. The other thing that affects rated capacity uh, are uh, uh, special needs, mental health. If a person is, um, if a person is decompensating on their mental health needs, they can't be sold with someone else. You know? uh, so they would be a danger and a threat to other people or mass assault, they can't be sold with everyone else. So they, those would be our single cell people. So that affects your rated capacity as well. So pretty much uh, uh, disciplinary status, females, juveniles, special needs, and mass assaults affect your rate of capacity. So at this particular time, um, uh, we're trying to figure out a way so that we can put a realistic number uh, there because when the media puts up 719 sales and you only got 500 inmates, that's not quite true because of the scenario I just presented to you. So let me ask you this. So from zero to 100% on capacity, how full are we right now today? Based on the based on all the information you just presented to us, notwithstanding the three 17 year olds, one 16 year old, two 15 year olds, 23 females or whatever that number was, where are we? We're pretty much, um, once we um, bring the 50 people up, we're, we're pretty much at, at, at a capacity. Okay, so we're gonna be near 100%, is that what I'm hearing? Probably 90. 90 plus percent. And, and, and that's probably a dangerous level to be at, right? It's a manageable level because it's within the capacity that we can um, oversee. However, if they arrested, I don't know, let's just say you, out of the 80 murders or so, you arrest 20. Yeah. Now there becomes a, a, a crisis, a problem. Those individuals probably won't make bond. You'll need 20 sales and they'll have to be all maximum security sales. And because of the nature of their crime, you'd have to assess, we do an intake assessment to find out whether they should be single sales or double sales. Uh, so yes, we're, we're, we're right at the uh, threshold where um, we can manage it, but it's tight. Yeah. Right. So. I think when they designed that facility over at CJC, they thought it was a great idea to have, you know, whoever's managing the sales to be out in an open space where anybody can reach out and touch them, which seems to be mind boggling to me that you would put the control board in a space where if somebody decided to be a knucklehead that they just overrun the, the guard and then take over the control board, which is basically what kind of happened when they start breaking windows out, right? Uh, that's true, uh, but um, one of the designers uh, that we um, are currently working with uh, created a design model where the officer would be basically on the second floor and operate a mini control center while we would still do direct supervision. So the person operating the uh, doors would be secured. Uh, we call that a control center. Uh, we are in the process, it's gonna take, like Jeff said, uh, up to about a year but that's on the board and Dr. Eisen is helping us to get the funding for that. Okay, so in the meantime, this person is going to be in an open space as traditional. Yeah, traditionally, um, the, the uh, officer, say again? As it was designed, until a year from now, that person is still going to be potentially in my mind harm's way. And if I'm using, you know, inflammatory language and it's not that extreme, just let me know. But it seems like to me, that person will continue to be in harm's way until a year from now. So what I would offer is we had lost um, some units, but there, I would also like the alderman to know, all the persons to know that there were some units that didn't participate and we did not lose at that facility. Of course, I wasn't there, but I was activated to come assist. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, say for instance, 3B uh, is comprised of older gentlemen uh, and they never 
involve themselves in any type of disruptive behavior at all. And, and so that model does work there. Here at MSI, the model has worked um, you know, since I've, I've been here, and we changed from indirect supervision to direct supervision. 4B, our special needs people, which I, I'm sorry, but I, I just forwarded um, a copy of the combined population report to Mr. Kennedy uh, so he could share with you. But uh, 4B special needs, they have never been a problem at all. And, um, uh, and, and, and they did not participate in any uh, disruptive behavior uh, as well. The females that were in 3A never participated in any disruptive behavior at all. And, and we never lost any unit on the fifth floor, which comprises almost 212 offenders. So I would say that there, we, there, there were some units that were lost, uh, but typically that was an unusual year um, that, you know, before that year, I'd been here since 2014 with Mr. Glass, and I had never seen uh, that type of uh, reaction before yeah. yeah yeah we in the community haven't seen the type of reactions today that we used to see 20 years ago either because we have a different generation of people and so that means that we need to govern ourselves accordingly so we do things today like put up more stop signs and more speed humps for speeding because we don't do real enforcement when it comes to speeding but that's not necessarily the sustainable fix so, yeah. so I, I, I would like to offer that I talked to uh, Dr. Isom as recent as this morning at nine o'clock, and we discussed uh, the replacement of the um, officer station. Um, and so we're in the process of looking at that, which is a shorter term uh, solution. Okay. Um, Dr. Isom, I'm gonna come back to you because, um, you know, nobody really communicates with the Board of Aldermen or the Public Safety Chairman you know, from the administration standpoint, much. You know, we have to find out what's going on from the news media, which is really unfortunate, but hey, if that's the relationship, that's the relationship. So it's my understanding that um, MSI is, is gonna be closed, but not really, because there's gonna be a pod for overflow. Can you explain to me if that's true, if, if it's true, how do, what does that look like? And how does that get funded? Right. Well, um, you know, just sort of backing up to the conversation about uh, direct supervision, I, I would say just to reiterate what um, Commissioner Carson said, is that we were doing direct supervision at MSI too. So, you know, the, the CO is inside the pod, uh, managing that pod. But, um, but so wait a minute, I'm going to stop you real quick, time out. But that was a different level of an offender, right? So yeah. the expectation was it's less likely for somebody at MSI to do what they did at the Justice Center. Would I be, is that a fair assumption? Typically, but, but the people who were in the uprising were moved to MSI. Yeah, uh, they should have stayed at the Justice Center, but because of what they did, they were moved to MSI. Right. So, so those were the rioters, the uprising people were at MSI. Um, so but they shouldn't have been. They didn't have a choice but to go to MSI, right? So don't make it seem I don't mean this disrespectful, but let's compare apples to apples here. You know, the people at the Justice Center that went to MSI were not the people that generally would have been housed at MSI. Because no, I agree. At MSI, the expectation is that their behavior was at a lower level. That's why one's called Medium Institute, and the other one is for you know maybe the hardcore offenders, if you will. I don't know the technical term. But right. there was a reason to separate the offenders in different facilities, right? Yeah, I mean, the only point I was trying to make uh, was that um, that the type of supervision and the structure of it in those pods were similar. Mm -hmm. But um, but to, to your point, um, you know, you always have to make contingencies, and I think that's what we're trying to do is. Um, yeah, the, the goal today is to move towards uh, closing MSI, uh, especially the workhouse portion, the older portion, um, but leaving open the option, uh, as you, you indicated, um, you know, if we go beyond that 90% capacity, uh, there needs to be at least some thought process towards what we do in that case. And so that's, um, that's the contingency planning that we have to have 
making the best out of the situation uh, that we have today. So um, if that answers your, your question. Yeah, and, and I support that. And I think that's a great contingency plan. And I was hoping that we would have something like that in place. However, how do we fund that? Because we've taken as much away from corrections as we can, you know, to close the facility. So if we use it as a contingency plan, because we got 30 people from the overflow that may need to go there, we have to send staff over there, you know, to monitor that, right? And so how do yeah. we fund it when we've defunded yeah. it? Well, we're, we're um, working out a plan to see how we can manage it with the staff we have. Um, we also have uh, funding for uh, extra security personnel through a, a contract through uh, GARDA. So um, we are working out the details if the fact is needed. That's if we need it. I think the my solution, uh, Alderman Boy, is to to work to manage the numbers appropriately, uh, whether it be um, you know detainees from other jurisdictions, um, whether it be um, you know federal employees or nonviolent offenders. Um, so to manage the numbers so we don't get to a point uh, where we have overcrowding. Um, that's what we've done so far, uh, and that's what we hope to continue to do. Uh, but as I said, you have to make plans just in case uh, something might occur. And so we're working through what that will look like if, in fact, we had to do it. Right. So one option, and it may not be legal, is police could pull over somebody and they have a warrant in Jefferson County and they just let them go because it's too much paperwork and a headache for us to deal with because we really don't have space for them. So that's option number one. Again, I don't know if that's legal or not, but that's certainly option number one. Um, but at the rate of the murders, and of course I just had an, another one to put in the, the murder column at Belt, I guess in St. Louis Avenue somewhere just yesterday, it doesn't seem like murders are going to go down anytime soon. And so we're going to continue to have this escalation of violence and we're going to continue to need to, you know, incarcerate people. And that's unfortunate, but it's the right thing to do if they're hurting people. My biggest concern certainly is trying to put, you know, 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound bag. We know it's going to bust at the seams at some point, but then when we do the overflow, so we can talk this talk about how, yeah, I got this contingency plan. I put all this money in, you know, in contracts with all this extra stuff. But yet when you move that money into a space that you're telling people is closed because it's deplorable and nobody should ever be, you know, housed in that facility, it's really a mixed message because if you're gonna use it as an overflow, that means we technically cannot close it. And I have a projection and you're smarter than me and I'm gonna give you that all the way around. You're smarter than me in law enforcement and academically. You have a PhD, right? And so I think by the end of the summer, you're going to have people at MSI. Whether we pay for, you know, whether we use the same staff at, at CJC and move over there, or we use, you know, augment them with, with, with some security people out of this other pot of money that we've done to set aside, we're not being genuine in our conversation about whether we're really closing this facility and whether it needs to be closed today. I, I really question if we're just going, moving too fast, you know, um, because we can do this. And, and I certainly, I'll say again, for the record, I can support closing the facility if we're to a point where crime is really plummeted in the city of St. Louis. Um, that we just don't need two facilities. But when you look at crime is on the rise, it, it's just intuitively not making a lot of good sense to me. And um, what I don't want to do is trick and bamboozle people and say I did something that I really didn't do. Because as long as the doors is open at MSI, it's not closed. As long as you're going to use it as a contingency plan, it is not closed. If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, chances are it's a duck. MSI is going to be a duck. And it's going to be a duck moving through the pond of water by the end of um, the summer. And so I just want us to be as responsible and as honest with the taxpayer as possible about what we're doing and making sure 
And I'm not the expert. I can only lean on somebody like you and, and, and Mr. Carson that we're not putting our staff in harm's way. While so many people are so concerned about the criminals, I'm sorry, I'm pro staff. I'm pro law enforcement. I wanna make sure that they're safe. Their safety is first and foremost to me because then when they're safe, they can create a safe space and a safe environment for the criminals. And yeah, we could talk about they were never found guilty, but they was charged with something and probably not for nothing. I would even submit myself to believing that 10% of them might've got a free case and that they probably don't deserve to be there. And it turns out in the end that they shouldn't have been there and that we wrongfully you know, incarcerated somebody. But at the end of the day, I just wanna feel like we're making the best responsible decisions for these citizens as possible. We don't talk enough about the employees. We don't. We have correctional officers that have feces and urine and spit on and all kind of stuff that goes on over there. But nobody talks about that. And that's why I'm excited to work with this new correctionals you know, commission if, if we get that thing passed. Because we have to be concerned about the safety and welfare of our correctional officers. And we must punish those who are not doing right by our citizens, like I saw on the news the other day, which was horrific. Um, they need to go, just like bad police officers need to go. We can no longer shield and cover up a bad law enforcement and bad correctional officers, whether you represent them as a union official or on the correction side or the police side. We have to fix the systemic problem. And the building is not the systemic problem. People keep saying we need to get to the root causes of all these issues. I haven't heard one colleague of mine tell me what the true root cause is and what the prescription for success is. We talk about it, mental health. We talk about all this stuff, but not one person I've heard define what the true root cause is because it's, it's more complex than just one or two things. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm done. I'm gonna pass the torch on to somebody else. But I, I, I you know, I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. You know, uh, I'm, I'm just, just going on what Alderman Boyd said, just real quickly. Where's the funding gonna come to keep it open? Where's that money coming from? And are we gonna tell the police now? that they are no longer allowed to pull somebody over that's wanted for something in another community, uh, you're not allowed to tell, hold them, just let them go. Which will, will actually bring more crime into the city, but is that what is that what you're saying? Because I, 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 that's also the question that went through my mind. So the two questions that Alderman Boyd asked that I never heard answered. Are we going to tell the police then if you pull somebody over and they got warrants, just let them go? And the other one, where's the funding coming from since all the funding was taken away? And I agree with Alderman Boyd. I'm all for the keeping that open in the pods, whatever, because I, I think it's going to be a disaster. But can you answer those two questions? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I, I never suggested that we were going to let people go. I, I think um, the alderman said that tongue in cheek. I don't think he, you know, actually um, expected us to let people go. And, um, you know, that's not what we plan to do. But I would also say just in terms of the correlation between MSI and the Justice Center, um, from a standpoint of uh, data, we've had the MSI workhouse and Justice Center for the last four years, and our homicide rate has continued to go up, um, not down. So the correlation between having MSI and um, crime um, is, is not there. What I will say is though, what we are trying to do and what we are doing as a police department is being very focused on who we're arresting, um, you know, being focused on trying to arrest and identify the people who are doing the shootings and the homicides and not a scattershot approach of arresting, um, you know, people who we don't think are part of that. So being very focused, I think will um, 
one, help the violent crime problem, but also um, not unnecessarily put people in jail that don't need to be put in jail. So that's the first thing. The, so, the, the, so the second thing is, um, you know, we will, as I said, work through our existing budget and staff. Um, you know, there would have to be some um, monies um, for uh, personnel, but we think we could supplement that with uh, some of the money we have right now. So uh, I, I think we have a plan if, in fact, that's needed. But I, I think right now uh, we are working towards keeping the numbers down. Um, through uh, managing the number of people in there, um, managing um, the movement of people out to other uh, municipalities who have people we're holding. Um, so we're, we're doing, we're going to do a, the job of trying to manage the facility better and the number of people in there so we don't have to have uh, that contingency plan in place. Uh, and I also say that, um, as I said again, uh, we were short staff at MSI, uh, and there wasn't proper staffing at both facilities. Now we will be more adequately a staff at one facility, and we will work to continue to manage the numbers so we don't have overcrowding. But as I said, if that occurs, then we always need um, a contingency plan, and that's what that is. Well, I mean, it, it certainly goes against re- like re uh, using that building for something, repurposing that building. So it will stay as MSI, we can call it whatever we want. Um, and I do get concerned when you say, and I'm not, this isn't tongue in cheek, when you're saying we're gonna concentrate on those that, the murders, well, you know, and I'm noticing it more and more now, if your house is burglarized, the police don't come. I guess, is that the plan? We just, burglaries are okay. And, uh, you know, we're only gonna, you know, I mean, you know, the police don't come. I mean, they'll call them, they'll tell you, so we can take a report over the phone, but the police don't show up if your house is burglarized. I'm already having that happen over here. Is that the plan to just let most crime go? And we're just gonna concentrate on the murders? And I'm not doing that tongue in cheek. I'm serious. When we're already, we've already decided traffic. I can go. I can race down Watson. You know, in fact, I think the average speed in my neighborhood, seriously, on Hampton Avenue, is probably around 50 plus miles an hour. So, is the plan? We're not going to do traffic, and we're not going to. Do arrest anybody if you burglarize a house. We're just going to concentrate on murders. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a ridiculous assumption, but um, no. Okay, well then, so but you're saying well, we're going to concentrate on the murders, and we're going to somehow pick, you know, uh, uh, who all. Gets arrested, I guess. I don't. I don't know. I'm still confused. I support keeping it open. I, I'm. I'm not opposed to the overflow plan. I'll even help try to find money. But um, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna move on to uh, who's next on the list would be Alderwoman Davis. You're next on the list. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> to the previous speakers, I really don't have any questions. I'm just going to make a couple of observations and move on. Uh, I can't blame you, any of you, for where we are today. We unfortunately did not uh, anticipate where we are as far as needing and having a, a plan that is properly diagnosed and executed. We're not allowed to do that right now, and that's okay. I can't blame you for that because I respect all of you and your knowledge and your integrity, so I cannot do that. But what I can do is I can say to those who are affected by our systems that they have rights. They need to know that they have rights. They can complain on a number of different levels and the oversight that automatically comes 
with inspections will also bring us to probably doing something different. So in the meantime, when I look at these numbers and I look at our crime rates every night, not some nights, but every night, and honestly speaking, you, the police department is doing a better job of catching these folks. Um, we are going to foresee some challenges. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be the legislator that is going to work with uh, whatever comes to us in this process. And we will try to bring remedy to it, but we will also let our public know the, the truth about the matter because I haven't had any public tell me they wanted uh, to close MSI. And I have one, uh, now I have one of the top 10 uh, neighborhoods with crime. And for years we had abated that crime, but based on a number of things that have happened in the last five years, our city is under, really our region is under siege. There's no respect for the law. There's no respect for humans, their property, or even just a simple humanity of life. And so again, I'm going to work with um, the problems as they come to us. I don't foresee how this budget process that we're talking about is going to work, nor this um, hold your breath and hope that everything is going to be okay works. So again, I do appreciate you all for what you do. You are extremely capable uh, people in your positions. Uh, and it's a shame that you can't do what you know how to do extremely well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Alderwoman Carol Howard. Yes, Dr. Isom. Um, you mentioned something about detainees from other jurisdictions. I understood we were no longer taking detainees from other jurisdictions. Um, maybe I missed, maybe I misinterpreted what you said. Um, can you explain? Yes, Alderwoman Howard. Um, as you might imagine, you know, officers um, will stop individuals from all over the region, um, even people who may be from out of state who might be wanted or have a warrant in another jurisdiction. Um, so if you are wanted in St. Louis County, even in Illinois um, or further out, um, those people are arrested here and held um, and await pickup from the other jurisdiction. So um, that's what I'm referring to. And those could be um, probation, parole violations. So, you know, if parole is revoked, it'll go back, you know, you'll go to prison. Or if parole is revoked, you'll go back to prison. Um, if, you know, it's a, a warrant for, we'll say, uh, stealing out of Chesterfield, uh, then Chesterfield or St. Louis County will need to come out and pick that person up and take them to their jurisdiction. So that happens all the time. And, and those numbers ebb and flow, you know, based on how many people officers pull over at night and, and they run a record check and, and find out if they're wanted. So that number can balloon very quickly, but it's not, oh, those, are not those are not necessarily our people though, um, and our detainees. Well, I, and I guess my thing is, is it still puts a load on the, the, the prison population. Um, how long does it usually take for them to be picked up? It, it depends. Um, it could be a week. It could be even longer if there's a, a parole, parole violee. Um, so, um, and that's what I talked about is, is managing that situation, calling, getting people to pick up, you know, notifying probation, parole to pick people up, um, you know, working on a daily basis to make sure that number doesn't balloon and that we are able to move those detainees to the appropriate place quickly. So is that a duty under the purview of uh, Mr. Carson? Um, well, it's a combination between uh, myself, Carson, and also the police department 
Or uh, all three of us play a role in that. Okay. And the courts. And and the courts. <laughs> okay. Um, have con in other if, okay. So if we have overflow, uh, have the contracts been uh, signed, sealed, and delivered for to handle our overflow, or is the CJ is the uh, MSI going to be our overflow? Yeah. So if if we need it, and I, I'm hoping we don't because we, we will be able to manage the numbers appropriately, um, we would use one pod in, um, on Hall Street, one pod as um, sort of the temporary holding for those individuals we're talking about, um, you know, for individuals who are awaiting other jurisdictions to, for them to pick them up or awaiting a court sentencing. Um, you know, those are the ones uh, that are um, court placement. Those are the ones that we would think we would use for that because that number could have could balloon. But we're going to work to manage that so we don't need to do that. Uh, if that makes sense. Well, hypothetically, if if we really get you know going on the crime issues and start arresting these people and holding people accountable, um. And we run out of space of the one pod that we're going to remain. Well, we're going to have for a contingency. Where would those prisoners go? If you filled those spaces, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm not sure what you're referring to. I'm sorry. Now, to are are we? Well, we were talking about. I mean, at one point they were talking about moving people to other prison systems outside the city of St. Louis. Is that no longer what we're doing? Are we just going to use our the MSI as the um, alternative housing? No, I, I don't have any plans to move to any other facility at this point in time. So I'm confused, I, I guess. I, and I guess it doesn't matter, but I think that in all transparency, we're going to continue to use MSI for overflow. Is that correct? Well, what what I would say is we're going to use the one pod in MSI. I think there's two there's two different things here. Um, okay. What has traditionally been the workhouse is the older portion in front. There are four pods that are in back that were built way after the workhouse. Uh, those pods are constructed exactly the same as uh, CJC as the Justice Center. They okay. are pretty much identical to those. Um, they are older, um, but um, but not as old as the workhouse, which is the front portion. Right. Um, but that is a contingency plan. Um, we're hoping we will not need that. Okay, and then you also said you were gonna be borrowing locks from that area to put into MSI. So I guess that's another issue that if you're gonna use the locks from there, will that be secured? That no, I, yeah, I think I maybe you misunderstood. I, I said the locks are the same there as they are at uh, the Justice Center. Oh, and I, I, I misunderstood. I thought that you were making the point that the locks are the same and they could be used to f repair the ones at MSI. So, um, I don't know. I agree with the older woman from the 19th. Uh, I don't I don't understand. But, you know, I hope this all works out and I hope we end up with a safer city and we can get the offenders uh, under control and into court and, and hold them accountable. Um, thank you very much for your time. That's all I have. Thank you very much. OK. Alder, uh, Alderwoman uh, Kara Spencer. Alderwoman thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, I didn't know if you were there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, and I, I just want to thank the Director of Public Safety for being here and answering our questions and talking with us. Um, and Mr. Chair, thank you for you know hold, hosting this hearing. Uh, I'm curious what the you know what the authority of the Board of Aldermen is in the decision making here. Um, you know, I think that the public, the transparency involved in this conversation is important. Uh, and, um, 
you know, answering questions is important and kind of going through some of these details, but does, does the Board of Aldermen really have any authority in this matter? Was my, was my question audible? Who, who, who were you asking the question to? I guess that was a question for the Director of Public Safety. I, I'm I'm not sure. I think what you indicated the the transparency is important. Um, you know, for the public to understand the direction um, that uh, we are going, and um, so I think um, I think that's important as you indicated. But I but at the end of the day, the Board of Aldermen has does not really have any authority on what happens on the contracts. I appreciated the alderman, alderwoman from the 14th asking about the contracts and that sort of thing, but we don't really have any authority in this matter, do we? I'm, I'm not sure whether when, you do or not. Um, <laughs> I think I mean, whether was, we use whether we close the workhouse or consider the first part of the workhouse or keep the pod open or that sort of thing, these are decisions that are being made outside of the board of aldermen. Is the point I'm making? Oh yeah, well, there, there are certainly um, uh, alderwoman Spencer operational decisions. Um, you know, working through the logistics of um, closing uh, MSI and the pods behind them and um, moving. You know, detainees and personnel down to the Justice Center, um, you know, working through the processes of how that's done, but also, um, you know, leaving options open for contingency. Um, you know, I, th I think that is um, what people would expect um, to do in an operational decision like this. Um, so, um, so yeah, these these are um, operational um, decisions. Right, I appreciate the clarification. You know, just in, as far as you know, sort of where the buck stops, um, and uh, that sort of uh, viewpoint uh, is helpful for clarification. And I appreciate uh, the the uh, the answers. That's all I have, Mr. Chair and and Director. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Okay, Alderman Pam Boyd. Hello, thank you all for coming. Um, I, I've been listening and, and a lot of conversation that I'm hearing, ironically, I was saying this in 2017. And when I say that, I say, uh, I had ironically called the mayor at that time and said that my ward was under siege. And so we have bodies dropping like as old people say, like hot cakes every week, we were losing, it was from children to adults. And so I'm listening and I've been advocating for the staff that's dealing with the prisons that we have. I'm hearing the police, how they kept saying their hands were tied. And I'm hearing that we, I keep listening, keep thinking back, 14 children are dead and nobody's been caught. They had two riots in the Justice Center and they didn't say we overcrowded. They said we want a trial. And so I see Mr. Carson here. I see the public safety director here. I see Jeff Hansen. You all are trying to explain to us the logic on how you doing what you are doing and improving the system. But I don't see any judges I don't see the circuit attorney. I don't see any attorneys saying we're holding court, we're prosecuting people, the police are locking people up, and so we get in the court. Let's just be real. These people are pissed because they've been in jail for over a year and have not had a trial. That's the real deal. These people, and, and if I'm not mistaken, I'm not a lawyer, but it says every person should have a speedy trial. So we in violations of these people. We got all these protesters saying it's the city that's mistreating these people. No, it's not. 
It's the judges. It's the circuit attorney. They're not prosecuting and sending people to jail. They're not going to court. And so I don't understand this. Now we have guards that are that are that are in danger because they're out of ratio. Then we put them somewhere where they have to escort people everywhere they go. But nobody sees it's a problem here. It's a quality of life issue. That's what we looking at, people. And we got I got 79 year old women that are sleeping on the floor because they scared to sleep in their bed because these hoodlums are using these assault rifles and shooting up everywhere and nobody's going to jail. So until we hold people accountable, until we get the proper staffing and continue to support Carson and, and Jeff in regards to these employees, it's not going to change. You can keep sugarcoating these crooks if you want to, but until they knock on your door, you are not gonna understand what people dealing with. How you gonna explain to that mom that lost her baby at seven years old? How you gonna explain you don't have nobody in custody? To me, that's injustice. All these protests are saying we we mistreating people. How you gonna say we mistreating people that's killing kids? You all need to sit up and take a look at what you are doing. And I don't mean this to ISO and Hans and Carson. I mean the people that's hollering, close the workhouse cause it's inhumane. But you got people stacked up in the justice center and locked up for 23 hours, really? Come on, do you all not understand what's going on? We got a justice system that's not making sure that the good police that's out here trying to catch the bad guys are not being supported to lock these people up and then they don't go to court. So what kind of message are we sending? Cause they said ain't nothing gonna happen to us. It's just like your child. If you don't never do nothing, you keep saying, Jimmy, I'm going to whoop you. I'm going to whoop you. Jimmy said, you're not going to whoop me, and I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing. Next time, Jimmy going to cut your hand off. So y'all can keep playing with my seniors' lives if you want to and keep thinking it's okay to kill my babies out here. But if you haven't ever woke up as a black mama fighting for your kids, don't tell me what's best for my community. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alderman Bosley, have you joined us? Or are you still in the other meeting? Did, um, um, he might still be in the other meeting. Alderman, uh, um, John Muhammad, are you with us, or Alderman Muhammad? Again, I know some of them are tied up in that other meeting. Alderman Oldenburg? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Public Safety Director Isom, and I apologize if this was covered earlier, um, but hear me. Can you speak to me about the, um, the federal detective? detainee contracts that exist and how that fits into uh, your calculus going forward on managing the population. Um, are those contracts canceled or will we still retain some federal uh, inmates um, and uh, going forward? Um, I, I didn't get in and uh, Commissioner Carson could weigh in on this. Um, the the contract will still exist, so we could still hold federal detainees. Okay. But as you as you might imagine, um, if we're trying to manage the facility and the numbers, um, we we certainly um, can't hold uh, federal detainees. I think um, the last count I had, I thought we had about thirty uh, federal detainees left in the facility. Um, okay. Those that ebbs and flows and they, they're they moving out um, um, from day to day. But uh, to your point, um, you know, if we were to, to get more capacity at some point in time, uh, we could take in more federal detainees. So that, that agreement still exists. 
Um, but so we don't plan. Kind of a, a con just, I'm sorry to interrupt. The agreement's yeah. a construct, and to the extent we, we accept federal detainees, you then just invoice uh, the folks for, okay. okay. Yes, sir. Understood. So figuring out the population and the constructs around it is, is what what will drive um, the ability for for the city to take on um, any federal detainees and charge for them. Okay, yeah. that's helpful. That's helpful. All right, that's all I had, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Alder Omen Muhammad is having trouble connecting. He is here. He sends in a thing and he asks, "Do we have any active or current contracts with any other?" Uh, jurisdictions uh, to house detainees. Um, anybody want to answer that? Uh, public safety director or? So um, we looked uh, uh, to, to uh, areas around us within 50 miles and we had absolutely no tickers. So we have the city of St. Louis has no contract with anyone to place offenders anywhere. So, so the people that that we've housed up north in, I think it's Clark County, which is the farthest north. Yeah, I, I want to make a correction on that. Uh, the, I was corrected. I, I wanted to verify the information. It is Clark County, but it's not in Missouri. It's in Indiana right across from uh, Louisiana. And those are all, I mean, I'm sorry, Louisville. Uh, okay. It's Clark County, Indiana, next to, uh, across the river from Louisville. And those were all federal detainees. And we have, unfortunately, no input into where they're placed. And, and um, Director Isom is correct. We have 30 people. I uh, told him about that today. Two are scheduled to leave today. So we'll have 28 federal people total as of about 30 minutes from now. Th those are the ones that are the ones that are transferred out of state, which I'm sure their families appreciate being transferred out of state like that. Um, did they have state and federal charges or just federal only? Um, you know, we have no control over the federal folks. No, no, no. I'm talking about the, the, the ones that went to Kentucky. Oh, uh, yeah, they did have some people go to Kentucky. I, I, I'm unsure, but I'm, I'm thinking uh, that the federal folks, uh, they give us a list and we give them the uh, person. No, no, I'm asking, did any of those people that went on uh, up to Kentucky? Uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure that some of them, uh, some of the folks were dual charged that went out of state right. because most of the offenders went out of state. So, okay, so how many, so there were people that would state with city charges that went to Kentucky. How many people, I know I've heard 54, I've heard more. How many people have we sent out of state? I, I don't know how many people we sent out of state, but I can get that number uh, for you. I, I don't keep up with them. I was really keeping up with how many are leaving the jail, not where they went. But, but I do get the list. Um, and I can ask someone to look at, look up that information. So the other question. It, the list, the, the, uh, there was about 190 uh, when we started, and there's 28 now. So we've sent 100 and 20, so 150-ish people somewhere off to, to somewhere. Close to 170, I think, one second. 170, we've sent 170 people <clears throat> into some some other another state. I think you're right, one sixty. It's a whatever. Okay. You know, it's a, it's a close number. So we sent about one hundred and sixty people somewhere else, not even in the state of Missouri. We, we we didn't send them. They were they were the federal folks that were. Uh, um, uh, they changed the the federal folks moved them. We didn't send them anywhere. So so. But those are also people that had city charges. Some, I think and, it's about and, 56, yeah. And um, so the second question, these are questions from John Muhammad, Alderman Muhammad. Second question is, what are we doing about med medical food uh, for the current MSI detainees uh, when the budget's cut? So uh, last week, the I think you had said we cut $6 million out of the budget for medical 
things. Um, and so are we just not, I, I, I think the question is, are we just not, I mean, the people going over, or are we just not, I, I don't know how to pose the question. Um, but when you kick $6 million out for medical, how much is left, if any? Or are we just not doing anything about people getting sick? Uh, I think you're, you're muted, Mr. Clark. Uh, Carson, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about it, but of course, I don't, I don't decide where, where to get money, but I have brought it up to the public safety director, and we have had several meetings about it. Yeah. To, to, to ensure. So that's John's asking now what, right. what, what the budget. I mean, clearly, clearly we'll have to work through the details, administration work through the details of, you know, where that money will come from. I think there will be some savings with the reduction in detainees, but obviously there'll have to be some sort of budgetary changes to uh, deal with that shortfall. But um, so um, there will have to be some adjustments made. So, see, that's hey, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, you're, you're all good. That way you uh, can your questions. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, Director and uh, Mr. Commissioner. So we do not have a current transition plan as it relates to the fiscal operation for food and medical contracts as we talk about the, the closure of MSI. Uh, so you guys have been in conversation about it, can you expound on what those conversations look like or what is the what is the plan that's going to be set in place to fix this budgetary gap as it relates to these two crucial contracts for detainees? Like right. what's the place? So I heard you say it's going to be some type of supplemental appropriation. What does that look like? How much is that going to be? And has there been any conversation with the budget director on where that may come from? Yeah, I think those conversations are ongoing, so I don't have the details for that for you today. Alderman Muhammad, are you still there? It kind of sounds like it went silent. I, I am, Mr. Chairman. I was just okay. trying to trying to figure out how to ask this next question. Um, so what are we doing about the staffing problem? Um, so, so we talk about closing MSI and removing the correctional officers that's currently placed at MSI to the Justice Center. Um, won't there be a staffing problem or overcrowding of staff? Like, how are we how are we scheduling? You know, double the amount of COs for one facility. So I know we I know that there's a plan to keep basically to keep MSI open. With that plan and with the changing of, of, of uh, correctional officers and workers, what budget is what budget has been appropriated to keep MSI open? Is that money coming from the current CJC budget? Is that coming from another special reserves budget? Like, where is that money coming from, and how much is it going to cost to keep one section of the building open and one section closed? Like, how much is that going to cost uh, taxpayers? Those are my next two questions. Zero is the, is the answer. There's no budget for MSI at all. So so the uh, media and, and what, what I did, I mean, hopefully you would want your commissioner to plan for incidents. And so uh, in, my, in, my, in my learnings of incident command systems, you always prepare. So I offered... Um, when you brought up that you were concerned about people sleeping on benches and floor, I gave three proposals to the public safety director. Nothing uh, other than uh, the proposals. And then that proposal became into conversations and media attraction. So there is no authorization at this time uh, or plan to put anybody here. But if something were to happen and if, 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 if CJC were to be overcrowded, wouldn't you want me to have a contingency plan? So no, I have absolutely no money at all. You know what the budget is. It's zero for 632. 632 doesn't exist. But if the city of St. Louis, if something happens, 
Whereas the acting commissioner, I gave some suggestions to the public safety director of what could happen if we had an emergency. These are called tabletop scenarios all day long in any type of correctional and police um, uh, uh, thing. You know, we have a swap agreement with the with the county. They're overcrowded. They're short staffed. That that's what it is. So we can't even swap an inmate. Um, most of the other jails in a 50 mile radius will not take a St. Louis resident at all. St. Charles will not. St. Louis County will not. Genevieve will not. So we've already asked them several times as we were directed. So if something were to happen. You have no plan. I came up with three options for the public safety director to consider. And if and, and if those plans were accepted, then those individuals would be a post assignment, similar to the different floors at, um, at, at, at the CJC, fifth floor, fourth floor, third floor, second floor, et cetera. And so uh, we still have the training academy that's right next to uh, 632. So there is no money for 632 at all in the budget, no matter. And I will, add, I will add to, to what uh, uh, Commissioner Carson said, um, and, and I guess I could reiterate this. I, I think it's our job and our responsibility to, to prepare for contingencies. And that's why I asked Commissioner Carson that what would be, what is our plan? Give me some options if in fact um, we do have an overflow. So, um, I, I know, um, I, I think that's good management. I think that's good leadership is to think in those directions. Um, we're going to work towards managing the numbers. Um, so that is safe for all involved. Um, but if it's not, then we, we have a plan in, in place um, where we can manage that overflow. I wanted to address uh, um, a, a question that was posed by um, Alderman Vicario. So, uh, Ms. Taylor and I went over to CJC uh, since the last time we met. The last time we met, I think, was somewhere around June 8th. There were 50 people in the tanks, 50. There were six people uh, in the downstairs tanks waiting to come upstairs, which is 56 people. And so when we went over there, I, I went and, and looked at all of the folks that were there. We categorized them as the PVs, uh, holes for other jurisdictions. And we also looked in the PAH, which was 56 people, which was unusual. So we went over to the PAH area and we found out that some people uh, were being housed over there. They could be sailed elsewhere. Uh, so we cleared out PAH male, PAH female, we dedicated uh, housing unit 3A, which had 20 females, but 66 sales. And we moved those 20 females into PAH, which is post admission housing. Then we were able to put, four, um, we were able to put 45 men in those sales and get them off of the tanks. Uh, then with the help of uh, Dr. Isom, uh, we were able to look at the PVs, get rid of the PVs. So as of today's count, which I sent to Mr. Kennedy, we have nine people in the tanks and we have one person in the lower uh, lower area uh, holding tank area, which will come upstairs and we'll find out through video court what's gonna happen with that person. So currently in the post admission housing, we have 25 females and nine males and we have, uh, and we're using three alpha for men and we'll use four alpha for the rest of the 50 people. So those people didn't magically disappear, we managed them and we gave them sales. That's what we did. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. It's, it's a shame you didn't do that before. Um, I wasn't down there before. <laughs> so, so, so we managed it. So we're, so we're gonna go basic 101. There's a couple things that need to happen. I've already discussed these things with Dr. Eisen. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at, we're gonna do a complete audit of the facility to make sure all of the living units are up, up to par and all of the sales are online. At this time, I think there's about five sales plus the 132 sales that are offline. That's close, you know, about 140 sales right now offline. So we're gonna do that first. And I've written a, and I'll send you a copy of this if you desire, but it's my plan and it's internal. But I wrote a nine page report 
of what we were going to do and what my observations were and how we were going to get back to normal. Uh, and answer Alderman Coates, uh, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Alderman uh, 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 Muhammad's uh, question, the, between both facilities were short as uh, Dr. Eisen testified. So bringing both facilities together, you will not be as short, but you will not be full of staff. Uh, so, uh, so we'll be about 30 to 40 folks still down uh, as correction officers. And I, as I shared with Dr. Eisen earlier today, um, that was what they gave us, but the staffing TO should have been right around 232 people we will only authorize 186 people to run the bill. So we'll be short even for fully staffed. I see uh, Alderman uh, Collins Muhammad. Do you have any other questions? I also see Marlene. Uh, Alderman Davis has her hand, he has a hand up. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I do have more questions, but for the sake of time, I'll hold off. I will communicate my questions with the commissioner uh, directly. Uh, I trust his opinion. I'm just trying to understand this. It, I just seem like it, I keep hearing conflicting stories and conflicting plans. Uh, and that's the issue that I'm having. Uh, but I will communicate directly with the commissioner. I appreciate your leadership, commissioner, and all that you did do when you were superintendent for MSI. Because uh, I know you greatly changed that facility and offered a bunch of extracurricular activities uh, and opportunities for the inmates there. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, and the Alderman boy suggesting that we don't stop people who have warrants. I wish you would have made that suggestion three years ago for me. <laughs> uh, but thank you, uh, Mr. Commissioner uh, and Mr. Director. Thank you. I, Mr. I, I, I do want to say, since we're talking about contingency plans, one of my contingency plans, uh, which no one addressed, but I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you, uh, was to uh, continue to use the medium security uh, offenders to cut the grass at MSI. Uh, to uh, continue to uh, hopefully do some programming, uh, which would not cost because all of the uh, division, all of the divisional contracts for food service, medical are divisional. So they follow wherever the offender follows and they're already calculated in the numbers. So, but of course these things haven't been uh, approved, but those are things that I wanted to make sure uh, that, that, that um, my boss had all of the options that were available. So if, uh, you know, as soon as you get that first call that the MSI grass is four feet high, um, you know, we wouldn't have the adequate staff to be able to cut the grass, but we do have, uh, we have used the offenders since I've been here uh, to cut the grass. And, and again, at MSI, we still have lawnmowers, tractors, snow plows, and all of those other equipments that, um, that we need to operate this facility and the downtown facility as well as transportation vehicles. So we'll still have to have a contingency of people uh, to watch to make sure no one takes our copper, uh, takes our vehicles and trick, uh, lawnmower equipment and, and et cetera. Uh, Alderman Davis, and then we, we'll start going back down the list. You had a follow-up question. I did, and uh, the commissioner just answered part of it because I was concerned about the plan for mothballing the building. Uh, we can't afford to allow it to just totally deteriorate. And uh, just to clear it up for the public one more time, can you tell me when the older part of MSI was closed? Do you, what year? So MSI, uh, MSI uh, the brown part of the building uh, the brown part of the building where the dormitories were, if you can see this, you can see there's a white building and there's a brown building. Mm -hmm. On the top of this, which I'll send you a picture of, you'll notice there's about 24 air conditioners. Those air conditioners cover the gym, the chapel. Uh, now, when I first, uh, the dining area, the kitchen, uh, the administration area, and all of those areas, the only area that was not air conditioned was this, air, this small area here, which had the dorms. And when I got here, I, I introduced temp air, you know, so of course, you know, uh, you are aware of that. And, and so the first year that I was here, we had temp air and we still have them because of a lawsuit, we have to pay $100,000. So that uh, uh, a year just to get the temp air uh, into that lawsuit is resolved. So I don't even know if we have to keep it 
after we close MSI, we still may have to close that. So the first thing we did was close the upstairs dormitory area on, on this side and, and, and we moved everybody to the, and we double sailed the pods, which are the white building. We, once we double sailed the white building, which is they have four air conditioners on top, an air conditioner per unit and plus their own boiler system. Uh, then we started to move the residents, if you look at the combined population report, over to the new building. And, and from there, we were just using a few areas over here and we started to renovate them. And, and most of you have already seen the renovations that we've done on five units. And so we were we never really occupied the five renovated units because after we double sailed, we went over to this building here that was built in 1997. So we haven't used this part of the building in close to three years. Okay. We did use it temporarily for about six weeks because they sent us 340 maximum security inmates from the disturbances. And, uh, and so we had to use the dorms, uh, which the residents were <laughs> loved it because you have a day room, you have, you, you're not locked in a cell, you get to interact with people, you get to play cards, movies, vending machine. So they really liked that. And, um, uh, and, and, and uh, so when we moved most of the residents back downtown, then that's when everybody went back to the pod. So we haven't used the old part of the building for about two and a half, three years. Okay. The uh, But there was another section of the facility that was closed before that. Yes, yes. Uh, we had workers quarter two, three, and four, and we had some um, areas that I didn't like. They looked um, like dungeons. And so I closed those areas down uh, uh, as soon as I got here. Uh, close those areas down. So we never used those. We closed down the uh, medical area. It used to have a kind of light duty disability pod medical. Mm -hmm. uh, we closed that down. Most of that um, was closed down. And then we, we closed the first, first, the second floor first. The, um, then we started closing the left side of the building. The whole left side of the building was closed. And then I started working on what we, um, dormitories A, B, C, and D. So that was in what, 2014? No, uh, 2017, 18, and 19. 17, 18, 19, okay. So that's the uh, older part that some people refer to As who the, may have been incarcerated during that period of time. That's correct, that's correct. Okay, all right. The uh, other building uh, so, was built in 1996, 97. Okay, uh, and my last, uh, thing here is, well, maybe my next to last. So the sheriff's budget is affected by these new changes because I know in the federal contract, the sheriff was getting some of that money for transportation. No? No. Uh, no. Unfortunately, no. something happened where the sheriff did not get that money and so they refused to transport any um, ah. uh, federal people. And so as a result of that, they gave us our own transportation team, uh, which we would need anyway. So there were not eight or nine people uh, on a transportation team, which uh, doubles as our security response team as well. And so that we needed to be uh, cleared up. Thank you. Yeah. And, and then my last thing. And, is... and, and, and as well, Alderman, uh, Alderwoman Davis, those people were uh, paid for out of the federal money. So that was a uh, uh, part of the $6 million shortages also because we had one program manager, two case workers, and nine um, transportation members, as well as the uh, medical contract. That's part of the shortages that we're working on to, to, to cover. Okay. So I guess all I want to do is just make a statement because I should have done it earlier. And I wanted to apologize to the inmates uh, who had to be moved from MSI to our downtown facility, CJC. Because I do know that it's a different uh, quality of life. Many of them probably should never interact with some of those major criminals. And uh, I just wanna apologize to them. And hopefully we can get all this cleared up and uh, we can have a better facility if we're gonna manage one. But for me, if you're still gonna keep the other one open for uh, overage or nothing else to store all those things so you find a place to store them, 
that requires staff to be there. So, um, and a number of other things to take place. So I'll just be waiting to hear uh, additional information. Thank you. Um, so next we, we will be Alderman Brett and Ryan, and I'm sorry that. Hey, th know, Greg, thank so. you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a, a few questions uh, for Director Isom. Uh, so do we know how long it's going to take to repair the control panel at CJC? Well, as uh, Commissioner Carson said, we think that the, the entire process and, and what we're trying to do is take uh, pods, two units offline and fix everything and then move to each pod. So that whole process um, will take, um, we're thinking 12 months, hopefully, to, to go through all of that. Um, so we'll start with um, the third floor. We'll do everything we need to do, bring two pods completely up to date, uh, you know, sort of state of the art. <laughs> then we'll move detainees into that because that will be completely done and then move to the next pod, do everything we need to do. And so that's the progression that we will have. So um, we think that's the best option to do everything in two pods and then just keep moving. Now, of course, we've got to manage our numbers to make sure that we can do that. Um, and that will require, you know, working with all of our different partners, whether it's the courts, public defenders, circuit attorney's office, other municipalities and jurisdictions to make sure that, um, you know, we're holding the appropriate people. Uh, and, and right now, um, you know, we, we're, we're in a pretty good place to do that right now. So are, are, is the, the Justice Center as it, as it sits right now, uh, is it meeting federal standards for holding prisoners? Is it meeting federal standards? Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, what, um, you know we're all, we've all found out now over the last... I guess six months or a year, and I, I'm not I'm certainly not blaming this on you, uh, but we've all kind of found out that the the locks aren't working, and I I I, I'm, I was just con uh, curious if if that's if the feds have expressed any concern about the facility, yeah. uh, if 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 that's why they're moving their detainees out of oh, the building. No, 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 no. I mean, um, there there is no indication that there's no reason. The only reason that we are uh, there are less detainees, federal detainees, is because of space, and that's that's it. So there's nothing about that. Now, um, you know, we would like our facilities to be certified, and as you 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 indicate, I don't think they are uh, neither one of them. Um, but hopefully, when we do all of these upgrades and we make it state of the art, <laughs> it will be in a position. Um, where we will be able to get that certification. So uh, Commissioner Carson and I have talked about that. Um, that is his goal, not only uh, the facility, but also uh, training of personnel and certification of personnel as well. Um, but you're right. I mean, we, we didn't create this situation um, for both facilities, but we're working towards, um, you know, certification both of the facility and of personnel, and I'll let uh, Director Carson, um, Commissioner Carson talk about that. Yeah, um, so currently, actually, the, the federal government, uh, they wanted to put more federal uh, people in our system. It's just that uh, we wouldn't, uh, MSI went through the certification for uh, housing uh, federal inmates, and, um, and they approved it. Uh, so, uh, so, so no, the, the opposite is true. They were impressed with MSI and, uh, uh, and holding federal inmates here. The, um, at this time, there's no way that we could have had 190 uh, or 160 or so uh, federal inmates and close MSI. There's, there's, there's no way that we would be able to do that. So the decision had to be made, I guess, whether the nine, $9 million was worth it or not. So, you know. Right okay, now. no, that, 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 that makes sense. Um, and then, you know, I know part of the, 
the close the workhouse movement was not, it was larger than the building, the workhouse. A, a lot of it was also, uh, you know, a discussion about who, who we are incarcerating. Um, so has, has the, uh, the public safety director or the jails been in conversations with municipal and circuit judges uh, about, uh, you know, the, the, the real issue about, you know, simply the space uh, and, and what feedback, if any, have you gotten from judges regarding, you know, any changes that they may make to uh, who they're deciding that incarceration is appropriate for? Well, you know, I, I think um, because COVID has relaxed, um, as, as, as Alderwoman Boyd has said, cases are starting to move through the system more rapidly. So, um, you know, I think that is just a, a natural sort of progression of the COVID problems easing and people are starting to move through the system more. Um, it, it is a fact that um, there were a lot of people being held for long periods of time uh, because of COVID and, and that's starting to change. Um, I, I think um, both the police department um, and circuit attorney's office and the judges are um, working together to you know, figure out who are the people who really need to be held. Um, you know, identifying who are um, dangerous, violent offenders uh, that we need to 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 uh, hold in 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 as detainees. Um, I believe, based on the time I've been here, that that we are on the same page with that. That um, police department personnel are identifying people um, they feel are dangerous. Uh, the circuit attorney's office is listening to that, and they're uh, making the uh, appropriate argument to judges and, and judges are, are, um, are making those decisions based on that information. Now, certainly as many people indicated, um, we have a lot of violence that's occurring in the city of St. Louis, but I do believe that um, we are on the same page that those people who are violent offenders uh, and even repeat offenders to, to uh, Alderman Ricaro's standpoint uh, for uh, property crimes, um, uh, who are, um, you know, sort of prolific property crime people are, um, you know, uh, are, are being held as well. So uh, I think everybody's trying to make the best decision on who actually is uh, a danger to uh, the community, both in terms of um, person and property, and trying to hold those appropriate people. Um, with the understanding that these are people who haven't been convicted yet. Um, and um, have the possibility of making a uh, bond as well. Thank you for that. I and can, then, I uh, add, oh, absolutely, and, absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, so we print out the jail population, which gives the total class felonies and the felonies are A, B, C, and D, which the A being the, you know, the, the worst and B. So A and B are typically assigned to CJC. So this report as of June 7th, uh, and I have another one, I just didn't have time to print it out. Uh, there were 397 class A and B, which is different from when I first got here, it used to be 700 people at MSI and maybe 300 people at, at CJC total. And uh, then the numbers started to uh, flip the other way. The lower class folks, um, uh, class felony C's and D's, are uh, 14 plus 14 class C and 87 class D. So that shows that um, that we are doing something. Uh, and there's 37 unknowns, but we'll figure out why they're unknowns. Uh, there's about 49 to 49 parole violators with felonies. Uh, if we can get rid of those parole violators, we're working on that. Dr. Eisen's working on that. And there are other uh, uh, parole uh, folks with other felonies, 24. So you have about uh, 49 plus 24 uh, folks that typically could be off of our roads. Um, parole was a little slow. Uh, and I think since Dr. Eisen's been here, it's been a, little, a lot faster. And the other thing we're doing is talking to the, uh, we're using the bailout program uh, for those individuals that may be considered for bail. 
uh, and they come in and interview the resident to see if they're eligible for bail. In fact, we had 52 people the last time we talked and you notice that it's 51 now, that means that someone left. So, and it may be someone else to leave again before Thursday. Okay, that all makes sense. Um, and one, one last, I guess, question and thought. Uh, I, I, I heard uh, you indicate, uh, Mr. Carson, that uh, you were going to potentially use medium security inmates to maintain the grounds of MSI. Uh, yeah, yeah with, that, that, that was a proposal, but it's not been okay. approved. And, okay. but, you know, again, uh, how do you cut the grass, you know, and how do you, certainly. Uh, certainly. how do you replace a light bulb? We certainly don't have enough maintenance staff to do the maintenance at CJC more or less come over here. Now, uh, and you know, what I found, you know, the police, well, has well, an old, the police has an old building as well, right? And it's right across the street from the city jail. And guess what? They have people over there, even though it's not funded, there's some sections of people that are over there. They use it for a storage area as well. Uh, so, so it's still a city building. I mean, we could technically walk away and, you know, but it's a city building. So, so it, it, uh, my understanding from Rich Bradley is still our building is just not funded. Sure, sure. And so would, uh, under your proposal, and I understand that it's not finalized yet, just kind of piqued my interest. Would, would, would that be uh, volunteer duty or would that be something that you were assigned? Actually, um, the uh, St. Charles and St. Louis County, they're trying to get like us. Uh, we pay the inmates and we pay them more than prisoners. Prisoners get about 14 to $20 a month. Our offenders get anywhere from three to $5 a day. So we've actually had people to bond out themselves. Uh, so we actually pay and we use that, the commissary and the telephone revenues, they used to give back to us and we chose to give back to the resident. And that's why we do that. Uh, but St. Louis County is trying to switch over as well to, they, they used to give out extra food to clean the buildings and things of that nature. We pay the inmate, we give them a so, job. Yeah. So, so even if it was a pretrial issue, this would be something that people were volunteering for that duty. That would be yeah, something they, that they, they wanted to do. For, they, apply for it. they apply for it. Most of the residents apply for a job. So if they okay. want to be a barber, they, they submit an application because we bring them through, you know, we bring them through that re-entry restorative justice, fill out an application, get interviewed by the caseworker, and we hire them. Yeah. And put them on the payroll. So, so that's the process. So we typically don't use volunteers. We hire, make them go through that process. I like to try to Im imitate the real live hiring experience. You know, so okay. that's why we came up with the maintenance program, the barber program. We have a barber chairs. I know you've not been here, but some of the other uh, older persons have seen our barber chair. Because why would you put them in a chair? I want a barber chair. So we have a barber chair, a sink. Sure. You know, no, I, I, I was there under the, the previous administration. I okay. did go uh, okay. down to uh, to MSI. I've been there several times and I, I, I am familiar with the uh, with the barber program there. Uh, I think yeah. it's great. Um, OK, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that that there wasn't some sort of punishment uh, duty for cutting no, grass. No, for no, no, most, most people, most people, you know, think about it. If you've been locked up for three years downtown, you never went outside except for mm -hmm. transportation. And I created the outside recreation program and the um, uh, bill, billboard program with uh, Alderwoman Davis. So we let people go outside, they can suntan, they can cut grass, they can paint on the plywood. You know, what else do you have? We have movie night. You try to, you try to uh, give them those skills and the resiliency and, and normalize what I call normalize the culture. So guess what? You look at the use of force, five, Five years ago, you look at the use of force now, you have less use of force, you have more interaction, you have skills, you have programs. So that's why we uh, we call it uh, programming dosing, but uh, you introduce the program dose. Someone um, want, want to learn how to be a baker, they learn how to be a baker, you know? So we actually gave a food handler certificates and things of that nature. I mean, just think if you walked out of jail, you were found innocent and you had a food handler certificate when you came out. Uh, we've even had a graduation program, again, uh, Alder Woman Davis helped us with this, inside our gym. So the person got their GED in the jail. And so, and they wanted to, they got out of jail and they wanted to have their graduation program in the jail. 
so that all the other residents can see them well, get their certificate. And the board of all the persons gave her a, a, a resolution, you know, from from the board. So so those are the types of things that I think we can still do, and I think we still should do. Uh, other jurisdictions, they use uh, residents, low-level residents that typically are housed uh, to, to uh, clean Hall Street, pick up the trash and things on the side of the road. And, and those things are good. They're called community service. So you teach a person to pick up trash. Maybe they won't throw trash on the side of the road. If you've been on Hall Street on a Monday morning, you'll see a whole lot of beer bottles and, and trash every Monday since I've been here. So, uh, so uh, but, the, but the residents, we let them work inside the fence and pick up those papers and, and, um, and cut grass, draw pictures, you know, instead of graffiti, we actually authorize them to draw pictures on the wall. That way I approve it. So those are the types of things I'd like to continue uh, to do, and we have the option to be able to do it without increasing the funding, and we would use the same staff that will be supervising them anyway. So. Okay, no, that all makes sense to me. Uh, thank you uh, for taking the time to come and to uh, answer all my questions, uh, and that's all I have, uh, Mr. Chairman. So, although we got two people that still need to speak, Alderman Boyd had his hand up, which I missed. I'm, I'm sorry, Alderman. Yeah, Alderman. Uh, Vice Chairman Boyd had and Alderwoman Boyd. The yeah. two Boyds both have their hands up. Um, but so these programs, as we put people over there, my understanding from the last time, the uh, uh, since they have to be escorted, these programs go away in a sense. The, the Obviously, they can't go outside, but a lot of the programs, the moms and the babies and all that go away, right? Or did that change from last week? Well, you know, I I I'm, I, I like to be didactic in my thinking, and so um, I I I already have a team of folks to find out what types of programs we want to do. I want to upgrade the uh, recreation schedule. So um, I found out that some of the people were complaining about recreation. Uh, so um, and and they would get out. They would actually get outside of their cell, but they weren't allowed to go to a gym. They have a smaller gym, and so we're going to change some of the culture. Go back to corrections 101. I haven't gotten to that part yet, but we're. I have a couple teams that are looking at uh, uh, what types of programs we have. One of the programs that they implemented already is the females are now working in the laundry area. So it used to be a time females didn't even have a job outside of their unit. Now we're going to uh, let them wash the laundry, fold the laundry, and we're going to uh, come up with our little beauty shop like we did at MSI, and we'll still keep the baby baby uh, program that we did. I'm not sure where, we'll, where, where we will dedicate the um, contact visit, but I, I still want to try to, if a person has a baby inside the jail, allow them to hold their baby versus... Um, you know, uh, giving it to a relative and never seeing the baby again, except for through a, a glass window. So we want to keep those type uh, programs going. We just got to see how we're going to do them. Just such, such major change since last week. I wish you'd go back and look at your uh, interview in, in Ways and Means. Uh, it's it's, not, it's than... not too far. I'm just getting a handle on things. That's all. <laughs> okay. Well, it just seems that maybe you had a talking to and that, uh, you know, it just seems like it's a really big change. There's a big change, and, and there's there's going to be more change the next time, and 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 uh, hopefully you'll you'll keep track of the change. Well, Alderman Boyd, because we still have two members of that speaking. Yeah, Alderman uh, Alderman Boyd, then Alderwoman Boyd, and then, then we're going to move to uh, uh, Miss uh, Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to circle back around to a few things. Um, Mr. Carson, uh, we talked about, you guys talked about locks. So at MSI, the locks are electric, right? And at CJC, they're pneumatic. So one CJC is, is, is air pressure powered and the other one is, you know, electric, right? The, uh, no, the, uh, the pneumatics are on the fifth floor. The pneumatics are sliders. They're on the fifth floor. Okay. And the, 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 the other floors, which would be, there's only three floors to the jail and the rest are something else, but, but uh, the, the real jail is third floor, fourth floor, fifth floor. The fifth floor is pneumatic. Okay. They, they slide. That's what a slider is. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. 
And then the other doors are, are the same doors as, as MSI locks. So they're, they're, uh, you can open up what we call a code 10, you can open with a key or you can open them at the control center or the officer can open it electronically. Gotcha. And, and MSI has electronic like that, right? It's same thing, yes. So are we are we getting away from the pneumatic and go all electric or, or are we just going to keep that same program? Uh, okay. Yeah, the pneumatics are the pneumatics are uh, kind of outdated. Uh, oh. The sliders, uh, because number one, when you have a slider, you have space. So if I have urine, I could throw it through the, <laughs> through the sides of the door because it's too much space. So okay. they're kind of outdated. Um, uh, so the but the fifth floor is pneumatic. So as you work at repairing, you know, because I'm hoping that the money we spend is money we won't have to spend again, you know, five, 10 years from now. So it's been deferred maintenance for 20 years is my understanding. So whatever we do now should be more of a permanent fix, updated permanent fix, right? Yes. Uh, so so when I got there uh, to CJC in 2014, August, um, I did a security audit the first day I was there. And before the first week was out, I identified what needed to be fixed, the lights and the locks and, and things. So the locks aren't misfunctional. What happens is, in a security lock, the spacings, they, uh, those, those security doors cells have spacers. And over the years, the space spacers have disappeared. So there's wiggle, you know, like a little wiggle. Like if you take out the stripping of a door, yeah. there's a little wiggle. And so with that wiggle and the inmates start um, tampering with the locks, putting uh, paper and Debris. But, but, but we fix that and go all we fix we fix that because they're no longer felt or rubber which they used to use in the jail i don't know why uh, now it's just straight metal on metal and so the doors fit exactly and the glass is ballistic glass okay ballistic right. glass so you won't be able to break the glass is is ballistic you know so so uh that that those are two good things about the uh doors that are being placed in right now right and so the programming you were talking about. So you think that you could still use MSI to do some of the programming with the people that's housed at CJC? Is that what I'm hearing you saying? Yeah. So the medium security inmates are still medium security inmates. Yeah, but they're not going to be yeah. there anymore. They're going to all be at CJC. Right. So, but the classification stays with them just because oh. they're housed at CJC, they're still medium security inmates. Gotcha, okay. And, and there's a difference of movement uh, with medium security inmates versus maximum. Like you don't use maximum security people to work out in the yard, you gotcha. know, but you can okay. use, and that's that's pretty much a classification system all over. So the same thing in the prison system, same thing with jails, same thing with the jailers on the side of the road, you know, picking up, you, you know, uh, doing community service work. So those individuals would be eligible for uh, a full movement. Okay. I mean, if, if the plan were approved. And you're saying it wouldn't cost us any more money to no. shuttle them from CJC to Hall Street and no. back once they've completed their training. Okay. Um, so that's good, though. So, um, Dr. Isom, you, I need, I'm going to use your lean on your academic experience. You know, there's this old saying that really is 10% of the people calling all the problem, but people feel 90% of the community is that way. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. So when we look at, I just wanted to get that on, on, on record because I just hate when people keep saying the city is so bad, but it's just in my neighborhood, it, it's just really 10% of the people that's causing all the havoc. Um, there was some conversation about, you know, who we incarcerate and, and start looking at, um, I guess, not overly incarcerating people. But when people commit a crime, whether it's a felony or a state charge or a city charge, the police still have to do their job, right? Absolutely. So if a person get a felony charge, we have to house them, right? And, and let's say we have to house them Walk me through this. So we, we, we're not want to deal with a federal contract anymore. If you pick somebody up on a felony, how do we process them? Right. So, you know, what I will say to you, and, and I'm on these uh, daily calls with the police department every day, that, um, you know, the police department is out there uh, 
that he's trying to identify these people who are committing all types of crimes. But uh, to, to walk you through the process, um, we'll say a person is um, found uh, to be arrested for a felony stealing, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, they were walking down the street and they saw something sitting on a table, laptop, they stole it. Um, police chase them and they arrest them. Uh, that person would, of course, be arrested for felony stealing. Um, there would be a police report done. Um, that uh, report would be taken to the circuit attorney's office um, if, in fact, they believe they had enough to make a case, um, then that case would be issued, um, uh, meaning that um, they're going to pursue uh, prosecution. Um, then there would be a process in which uh, that person would, uh, you know, ultimately get a bond hearing, um, you know, depending on the person's record, uh, what they've done, um, number of different factors. Generally, in a case like that, I would assume, because it is a, a nonviolent felony, that that person wouldn't be held for trial. Uh, uh, so the consideration would be whether or not that person was uh, a danger to the community or a flight risk. Um, and those are the things that the court would have to weigh. Um, so th th those basically, I mean, there's some other steps involved in that, but that's basically the process. Um, so, so if the court says no bail, they can't make bond, then what happens in this new system? What happens? Well, if, if there is a determination that there is absolutely no bond at all, mm -hmm. um, then um, that person will be held until trial. So uh, for for anyone I think has that has you know mentioned this before in terms of COVID, if if you were in there for robbery first um, and no bond was um, provided for that person, they would sit in um, the justice center until um, final determination of sentencing or trial. Um, but but. But we don't have a contract with the feds anymore. So no, what do we do with them? I'm confused. Oh, oh, so you're talking about federal detainees? Yeah. Oh, so they wouldn't go through our process at all. Oh, okay. Um, no, they they would they would be arrested, and then uh, hopefully um, the f federal system would pick them up. The U.S. Marshals would pick them up and take them to their facility. Um, I don't know how quickly that happens. Um, you know, Commissioner Carson, could you? talk to maybe federal detainees who were uh, taken yeah. into custody yeah. by, by St. Louis police? Uh, if they, if, well, if they are by the St. Louis police, well, if a person is arrested and they have a federal detainee, then it will be decided whether to, um, you know, if the police stopped them, they would not stop them for a federal detainee it, 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 because they have a federal offense. But let's let's use the example of bank robbery. I think I used that once before. So a bank robbery is a federal offense and it's a state offense. And so the, the, the FBI or the arresting agency for the federal government can choose to say whatever the city does, that's fine. And okay. so they would drop their detainer or they would accept the detainer and you would put them into the St. Louis jail. If, if they have a federal detainer and they wanna prosecute like a gun charge or a bank robbery, same example, then they would, uh, they would take that person and house them in another area at this particular time. They wouldn't house them at CJC. Okay, but Mr. Carson, sometime they'll pick somebody, let's say it's a gun charge, they'll pick them up and it's a state charge initially, but then it gets elevated to a federal charge. So once it become a federal charge, are we just like going, you know, work with the feds to ship them to Dupo or wherever? Uh, whoever drops it first. <laughs> so if the feds drop it, then we own it, own the person. Okay. If we okay. drop the charge, then then they own it. Okay. So so when I took a tour of the uh, of the MSI, you had talked about how they do the baking and all that stuff there and then um they sent it to cjc right yes okay so are we going to continue that are they going to continue baking at msi or are we just gonna how's that gonna work now so um 
I'm not sure. I have to talk to Tyrone to, to find out. Who is Tyrone? If we, uh, that's the uh, contractor for the food services area. Because if we don't bake it, then we'll have to buy it. Okay. And inmates were doing the baking, and this was part of their training and how they can get the food handler certificate, right? Yes. Okay. So that. And, and we were baking all desserts, all breads, and all things that could be baked. Okay. And, and for, for, for the inmates to eat. Yeah. And which I think is an incredible program. Uh, I've, I've seen some on national news about how different jails are, are doing that part of rehabilitation, rehabilitation process. And some people have moved on and, you know, opened up their own businesses. Which right. Is yeah. Cool. Um, so the next few questions is more like a budgeting question. Uh, Dr. Isom, I hate to put you on the spot, but, you know, I don't believe in rumors and I always want to go to the source. So do you have a driver? I have a driver. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get it over with because people, I don't believe in rumors. So yes or no? No. Thank you. Do Heather Teller have a driver? No, <laughs> I don't have a driver. Thank you. I knew it didn't make sense, but I always like to ask because you know people throw all this stuff in the room mill, and I don't deal with rumors. I tell you one thing, Doctor Ison walks. Yeah, I <laughs> can, I he, he walks a lot. I, I, I couldn't imagine, imagine because I know I, I know he has a Rolls Royce, so I just no, he walks. <laughs> I mean, he, he's up and down that street. Man. But, but the, another thing I need to put to rest is. You know, it, it's almost like a us against them when it comes to MSI and what the conditions are truly in MSI. And so um, it seems like when the alderman walk through, it's a different experience than other people. And so, Dr. Isom, when you walk through MSI on this, you know, day that, you know, a whole cadre of people went through MSI, did you find deplorable conditions where inmates were housed? Notwithstanding the fact that there was some construction going on. So we got to throw that out. So if you went into a certain pod and there was chairs all over the place and there was construction and there was a leaky roof or whatever, that was under construction. When you went through MSI, did you find that inmate detainees were placed in inhumane conditions? Well, I mean, I can just give you my, my perspective on what I think, and everybody's going to have their own characterization of how they feel. So I'm not here to, to tell one person how they feel about conditions or versus the other. But what I will say is that, you know, I did see areas of disrepair um, in MSI. I did see that, uh, as uh, Director Carson, Commissioner Carson said, the the, the second floor of the dormitories were completely offline, um, that um, there were um, problems with, um, you know, the, the roof of the building leaking. Um, and so th there certainly are problems at the workhouse and not the least of which, um, you know, he, he talked about areas being closed. Um, so, I do think there are problems at the workhouse uh, that need to be resolved. Um, but beyond that, I'd also believe that um, based on the fact that we have two facilities, uh, both of which are short staff, um, that that is a concern as well, um, trying to manage two facilities with not enough personnel. Uh, and I also think that it would serve the, the city well to be able to put all of their resources into uh, the proper personnel at one facility, uh, proper maintenance of one facility. Um, as you said, you know, um, 20 years of, of not updating the facility and, and, and putting all your resources into doing it right in one place right. um, is what I, I feel. And so that's what we're trying to do is uh, make sure we have proper staffing, um, updated facility, manage the numbers, um, appropriately so we don't have overcrowding, uh, but also putting the people that need to be in there. I agree that there are some people need to be um, held in those facilities. So um, 
So my my characterization is that, yeah, there are problematic areas uh, at the workhouse, and I think everybody knows that. Um, and um, there would need to be additional monies to bring that up to date, including and additional monies to bring up the Justice Center. Um, so that that would be my my characterization of it, um, Alderman Boyd. So let me ask you a different way. Um, in your experience doing that, did you find that there were leaky roofs, bugs, deplorable conditions in which detainees were housed? That because that's what's important to me. If they yeah. were housed in deplorable conditions, because that's the narrative that has been floated. Yeah. Well, I, I will have to say, um, and this was even before I did the walk around tour with um, on that day, I, I did do a, a tour before then. And I did see see bugs in the kitchen, um, um, running around in the kitchen. Um, so I would assume that there would be in the living quarters, but also even the detainees said that, you know, sometimes they they said that there were bugs that in the food that was delivered. Um, so yeah, I, I visibly saw bugs running around in the kitchen area when I went there. Um, and, uh, detainees reported, uh, that they would periodically, uh, have bugs in their food. Um, and so I would imagine that if, if those two were the case, cause I wasn't there long enough to, you know, to be in, you know, held for a longer period of time, I would assume if they were in the kitchen and, and, and detainees were reporting that they were in their food. That they will also be in the sales as well. Gotcha. Okay, uh, Mr. Carson, since you've been the superintendent over there, have detainees reported to you that they had roaches or bugs in their food that they were expected to eat? No, I, I, you know, residents talk to me differently. I, I think that I get a different type of response uh, when I walk around um, than than others. But I've not received that complaint at all. In fact. I'm pretty sure you know my emails and everything I do is monitored and, and I have to give uh, copies of almost everything I do to the Arch City Defenders because of a lawsuit. Uh, so um, I've not received anything like that. But I do know that there are, uh, there. Uh, when I first got here, there were there were uh, bugs I, um, and, and pests. And I got with the uh, pest control person, Missouri Pest Control. And we came up with a plan. I've shared that with you before. And uh, one of the problems that we had with, uh, uh, when I first got here, they had problems with mice, but the inmates were playing with the mouse traps. And once you turn up or move a mouse trap, it, it, it becomes uh, ineffective. So uh, we, I, I had the uh, uh, Terry, the person to drive the uh, mouse trap into the concrete. And I shared that with some of you that showed you couldn't play with it. You couldn't turn it upside down and there were no pests um, that were located in the living quarters uh, since that time, uh, but but at one time uh, because we live in the in in a field area, uh, we were told that you have to keep the grass cut. If you don't keep the grass cut, then that's when pests could try to come in and change a season. Of course, uh, as far as roaches, uh, you know most of the food is prepared downtown, and we do have we you know all kitchens have problems with roaches. Um, especially in the drains, but we, we did have roach traps and frequent uh, spraying. Uh, but when things are down in a facility like the dishwasher, you're gonna have problems. And so when I walk around and I see that we have a dishwasher down or an ice machine down, we have to get rid of it or we have to repair it and trying to repair. Uh, so, so some of those things did happen. I wouldn't call, uh, our pest control person never said that we were infested. Okay. Uh, so, so, but we did have more more than the living quarters, um, more confined to the kitchen areas um, and the back dock area. But uh, I've not seen anybody with food uh, problems. Uh, Let me ask you this. In their food. Let me ask you this, Carson. In your years of um, in corrections, have you found that inmates, when they have an opportunity to have an audience that's outside of corrections, that sometimes they embellish um, what's really going on inside the correctional facility? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, that happens, that happens. And sometimes, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it's an opportunity to um, share what they really feel, you know? So if someone says they're cold, usually they'll tell us, we'll give them an extra blanket. In fact, it's kind of funny, uh, 
when we got the temp air, the second day we had the temp air, the inmates were trying to tear up the temp air because they said they were too cold. You know, and I shared that with um, uh, uh, all the woman Davis, and you know, so we had to try to figure out how to cut the air down. But you know, uh, I thought seventy three was good, but apparently people like like seventy eight, seventy nine versus seventy three. You know, so uh, but but things like that happen, and inmates do uh, tell stories. But sometimes they tell you things, and and that's why I listen to people uh, that you need to pay attention to. You know, so and when that happens. I don't show deliberate indifference. I show, I, I, I make sure that we try to fix it. Yeah. Well, certainly temper control, temperature controls are something that we experience all the time, whether you're in an office space or jail or right. wherever, you know, people body temperatures react to, you know, differently. So that, that's kind of expected. I guess I, I'm real concerned about people saying, you know, they have mold in food and they had roaches in food uh, and all of that. So don't respond no. to that. Don't respond to that. I, got it. I, I, won't, I won't respond to that, but what I will say is this. The, um, the, we created the baking program for a program. It didn't make sense to have two kitchens. All of the food is prepared in CJC, all of the food, and it's transported to MSI in warmer carts that are absolutely oven temperature. And so if, if a roach could survive in that temperature, it definitely is not running. So, so what you're saying? Chances are there was no mold in food. There's almost there's. I, no I've mold. never, I've never heard that complaint. I've never seen the okay. complaint. And okay. we do monitor the food. I, I personally walk to the food service area and watch it being dished, uh, as and as well as my major and my unit manager. I, I got you. Um, uh, uh, I'm not going to try to. We still got two. I, I know. I, I want to ask Heather Taylor a question. Yet. I want to ask Heather Taylor a question. Is she on with us? On. No, I don't think Heather is on. I see her at the bottom of my screen. Do you? Okay. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. I, I so, don't. Well, let me. Ask, I'm gonna go to Jeff Hans. Jeff. Jeff Hans, are you? I mean, I see him there. Maybe he's gone too. Jeff, are you still with us? Okay. Am I lost him? I know that uh, oh, so, so, uh, Adolfo Pruitt joined us. Let me, go, let, me, let, me, let me go to Ann Schweitzer. I see she's on. Uh, one, would you yield for a few questions? Alderman Schweitzer, are you here with us? Okay, so let me make this point. I, I just, it, I find it unbelievable that nobody can hear. Uh, all time. Alderman Olenberg, can you hear? Um, uh, Alderman Page, can you hear? I hear you loud and clear. Okay, let me ask you. Uh, Alderman Page, when you went through and did your tour of MSI, did you experience any deplorable conditions? Uh, I, in truth, did not. Okay. And, and uh, I had a few questions and comments I was holding until the appropriate time, but now may be that time. That's fine. Uh, why, why don't you go ahead? Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me finish and I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to him. Uh, okay, well, we, we got PM Boyd and we still got uh, Woman Clark. Uh, Heather Taylor, my point was going to be Heather Taylor went through this tour, but also went through a tour with uh, Dr. Isom previously. And if there were any deplorable conditions, I think it should have been a grand opportunity for somebody to point out to the alderman these deplorable conditions, but it did not happen. And I don't understand why it didn't happen. Alderman Bosley went through. He didn't find anything wrong. Alderman uh, Swicer, I don't know why she's not responding. She went through. She really didn't find anything wrong except something that was in an area that wasn't germane to the quarters in which the detainees were in. I mean, we can all walk through and find something wrong. When there's a change of season, mice will infiltrate your home. I've had to deal with, I've lived in the city over 40 years and I've had to deal with it almost every season. 
I have to deal with mice infiltrating my home and put down some glue sticks or mice traps or whatever it is. It's not an anomaly. Most of the, I'm willing to bet over half the people that I represent have experienced infestation with roaches and mice. What we do is we exterminate. We put together a plan, a treatment plan to get rid of that. Go ahead, James Page. I'm sorry, Miss Alderman Page. You can respond. Uh, well, one of the things I was going to, by the way, uh, I really appreciate the uh, testimonies of the three speakers and the energetic, passionate questions and commentary uh, from my colleagues. I was going to refer to a recent uh, tour uh, that I participated in at the workhouse. And there were a few, or should I say MSI, um, there were a few things that really came to mind. Number one, I saw no vermin infestations anywhere I went. And I will tell you, I accompanied uh, then superintendent uh, Jeffrey Carson and his maintenance person and my good friend and neighbor, uh, Alderman Brandon Bosley, uh, some of the people on the tour chose not to do it, but we crawled down through the boiler room, through the utility tunnels underneath the MSI. At nowhere did, at no point and in no place did I see any uh, mice, rats, roaches, or other vermin. As a matter of fact, uh, then Superintendent Carson took us through the kitchen and opened up all of the covers on the dishwasher. And that's one of the places where you can have uh, roaches and other vermin to uh, congregate. We saw nothing. Uh, one of the things I came away with, I was, I was pleasantly surprised that the MSI had programs that included uh, the barber training program that was mentioned earlier. The opportunity for people to get more uh, physical exercise outside. The opportunity for people in the appropriate trusted statuses to participate in groundskeeping, to participate in acting classes, to become bakers. Speaking of bakers, uh, myself, Alderman Bosley, and Alderwoman Schweitzer both, now we didn't steal them, we were offered rolls that were prepared by the prison bakers. They were so good that I asked Superintendent Carson, is there anywhere I could buy a couple of these to take home with me? So there's some positive things going on there. I cannot say that I saw everything that goes on there 24 seven because I was not there 24 seven. I was only there for a couple of hours, but the visit was extensive. Uh, another thing that I witnessed was that some of the pods were under various states of renovation. Some of the latrines and the showers had been completely redone top to bottom. Even the old cast iron pipes had been replaced with state-of-the-art PVC pipes. So I would assume that those are the pods where uh, detainees will be transferred in an overflow or contingency status. Um, I will ask um, our director of public safety and our commissioner, is that accurate? Will those pods that I saw that have been thoroughly uh, renovated and upgraded be used for overflow or contingency? Uh, yeah, uh, the public safety director, I, uh, Dr. Isom, mentioned that pod four, and we went in pod four, uh, and though that, that area was completely renovated. Uh, the, the, um, the floor was textured, the shower stalls were PREA compliant, 
um, which um, uh, pre compliant means that the person still has a privacy and we can see the head and the, and the feet. We talked about that and it was adequate lighting and as well as the officer station. And we were in the process of uh, renovating the uh, sales. Uh, so um, those those are some of the things. Yeah, so that would be you are correcting your assumption. If if we if we were to go to a contingency plan, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you for that answer. Uh, the next question that comes to mind is, and and let's help my understanding. It's my understanding that the quote, and I'm this is my word, consolidation into the CJC. Uh, would house, uh, and I'm sure they would be uh, housed differently and appropriately, but they would re they would house the CJC would house uh, A, B, C, and D felons all within the same unit. My question to you is the programs that we just went over. You mentioned some of them. I reiterated some of them. Will any or all of those programs be available, especially to lower level felony detainees at the Criminal Justice Center, such as we personally witnessed out at the MSI? So the, um, I haven't gotten to that point yet, but that is on the plan is to look at, um, um, to look at what they're doing now I've talked to the uh, program manager, Ms. Wright, and shared with her, I wanted her to have a volunteer recognition um, ceremony so we could see what volunteers want to come back in to the system since they've been uh, banned for about a year or so. Uh, so we're going to uh, have a meeting with all the volunteers, give them a certificate, let them know we appreciate them, and try to jumpstart um, our volunteer programs. Uh, as the city's opening up, we want to open up as well. Uh, so we still have some thoughts about other programs. And, and, and again, I like to be able to present thoughts so that, so that people will know that we have options. We don't have to just lock people up for 23 hours. Uh, so so my, my main plan would be to create, um, to reduce idleness of, of, of offenders, to make sure that we have uh, uh, adequate work programs and people have an opportunity to get out of their cell and do something productive and to have uh, access to doable programs. Well, thank you for that. And, and I, I was driving in a certain direction with this line of questioning, and it's this. When I was at the MSI, uh, your team, your staff told me that these programs contribute to reduced recidivism. Is exactly. that still accurate? Uh, yes, that is that's very accurate. In fact, um, you know, before I got here, I came from the state of Ohio, and we use best practices, and I brought those best practices here. And as I said before, um, actively involved with the American uh, Corrections Association, the American Jail Association, and uh, I just recently submitted to try to bring in Cage Your Rage, which is an anger management program and decision making program for offenders. Uh, we're going to try to implement that program at CJC. Uh, I'm going to challenge the staff to still have pro-social activities such as movie nights. Um, and once, when I was at CJC once before, we had a parenting program. So I'd like to have a parenting program to deal with those pro-social activities and decision making when it comes to family. Uh, and in fact, I just um, hopefully I can order some of those programs uh, from ACA because uh, uh, we'll be able to implement those uh, programs right at the Justice Center. So we're looking at expanding the programs, reducing the idleness, looking for pro-social activities. You know, in, in pro-social activities, so I can clarify some, some of these research terms, is, you know, uh, the good example is everybody's in the neighborhood and their idea of having fun is getting in the backyard, barbecuing, drinking, and smoking dope. But then you have this other family that's that, that their idea of having fun is getting in the car, going to Kings Island and going to the park. <laughs> and you have another family that their idea of having fun is going to a city park where they have water and wading in the water. And so 
all of those can be positive, but we want to try to teach offenders if, if their problem is drug and alcohol or, or, or mental health, then, then maybe they can save the whole family if we deal with those things. You know, it's like when I first got to CJC, I would see people get released and they don't have, uh, they don't have a, uh, uh, their, batter, their, their cell batteries dead. So I told Commissioner Glass, I said, hey, their cell batteries dead. We need to have a charging station. So we put a free phone, if you walk in CJC, we put a free phone in there. So when you get out of jail, you can charge your phone without getting kicked out of the lower lobby. And you can use a free phone call to call somebody that doesn't know you're out of jail. The other thing we did was um, uh, provide bus passes. You know, I came up, I brought that program to the City Justice Center back in 2015 or 16, uh, where a person gets out, they don't have a ride. So we'll give them a bus pass. You know, so, so we want to continue those restorative justice and community service type ideas. Uh, you know, there is a city law uh, that they passed several years ago where all community service should be done at CJC. Did you all know that? So every, every judge that says you have community service, they're supposed to come over to the jail and we're supposed to put them to work. <laughs> and we used to send them to see, uh, MSI to cut grass and, 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 and pick up trash along Hall Street. And I haven't seen that program active in a while, but, but we, we might want to go back and revisit some of those uh, older laws that were, were good ideas. You know, uh, community service is always a good thing. So my idea is to reduce idleness, to use best practices and give people resiliency skills so when they get out, that they, the recidivism is less. Right, thank you. I, I'm really encouraged by that. And I would really hope that as this plan uh, moves forward that these uh, positive uh, programs to reduce recidivism and to uh, to aid returning citizens, I think the term is, uh, to adjust once they are released. The last question I have is about the uh, CJC. Uh, much earlier in this meeting, uh, I learned that the maximum capacity of the CJC is 860. And then I heard a thumbnail number of 719. And then I heard that there are mitigating circumstances on either of those numbers uh, that have to be adjusted due to juveniles, female detainees, uh, special needs, uh, single cell requirements and the like. So my question is, what is a realistic range of the capacity, the real pragmatic capacity of the CJC? I don't feel like I know that. It is, it, it is confusing, but um, I'll give you the number, but I'd like to at least give you the example. So let's say a first time offender comes in and they're small in statute. And, 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 and they, um, they're, they're, they, they fear for their life because they've never been arrested before. That person would be in what we call protective control because you wouldn't want to put that person with someone where they could be taken advantage of. And so that person would have to be a single cell. Uh, now we do, and we designed the facility where some cells are single cell. You know, but sometimes the capacity of needing single cells may outweigh that. Uh, say, for instance, if you have, say, uh, when I first went down to CJC, I saw 50 people on protective control status. So the first thing I ask is, hey, who's doing reviews? Who did a protective a PC review? Nobody did a PC review. So let's go in and find out. Do these people really need single cells or can they sell together? How about two first time offenders with similar characteristics selling together. Can we do that? And so we were able to increase that capacity uh, closer to the uh, five, 589. Now I use 589 because two pods are down, 3C and 3D, which are 66 sales per unit. So that's 132. You subtract that from the 719 which is the rated capacity, and, and, and the number is 587. So, um, or, or, or 580, yeah, 587. 
So, so 587, I feel comfortable with, and we have just under 51 people, so we should be able to fit right nice. As soon as those two units are repaired, we'll put down two other units to repair those units as well, which again, you want to, you, we're at a perfect time now because if we can get those units repaired now uh, before the summer gets nice and hot and the arrest rates goes up, uh, we, we have a better running chance to, um, to house everybody in a safe and secure manner. So right now we're looking pretty good. In fact, this is the best that I've seen it in, in more than a couple of years. Um, nine people in the tanks, that's great. You know, um, usually it's about 45. Last time I talked to you, it was 50 people in the tanks. That's unmanageable. That's 50 people that we got to try to figure out what to do with that are not ours. They're actually belong to the police. They're not, but they don't belong to the jail. That's where people get confused. So the people that sleep on the floor are not arrestees assigned to the jail. They're people that were arrested and we're trying to figure out what to do with them. So the prisoner processors are, are, are basically clerks. And at one time they thought about um, uh, having the prisoner processors to report to the commissioner because they're basically clerk. They're the ones that book you in, you know, fingerprint you, enter you into the system, the muse and all of that. And so that's what they do, but their job is really not to supervise those people in the tanks. So we have to kind of do it because they're in our building. But technically they're not our people. Okay, well, uh, let me just follow up in a different manner. I, I still don't feel like I have a, a good number because that number is variable based on the situation is, is what I'm understanding. 587 is the 587. Number. Okay, so I'll write that number down. So 587 is plenty of capacity to house current detainees plus the detainees that are at the MSI currently with the cap with the fallback of moving some people back to the MSI as necessary. It, does that one sentence summarize the plan? Yes. When we add the 51, it, uh, our, uh, we would have actual bodies be 575 and we're still under the rate of capacity, yes. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Alderman Vaccaro. Chair Vaccaro, uh, I have any hey, uh, I, I uh, questions and comments. Thank you. Okay. I didn't know if that was your last comment. And I could trying to unmute myself, which was getting difficult. Um, and I know that Alderwoman Clark Hubbard hadn't spoken yet. Uh, I also know Alderwoman Pam Boyd and all the women, Christina Gracias, they have their hands up. So let me go to all the women, Clark Hubbard. Are you still with us or are you offline for a minute? I know people are doing different things. Let me go to uh, all the women, Pam Boyd, you had your hand up. Are you still with us? Okay, then I'm going to go to all the women, Christina Gracias. Are you still with us? I am. Thank you, Chairman Vaccaro. I apologize. I am uh, picking my kids up from school, so I just pulled over to the side of the road and I can't join with video. Is that okay with you, Mr. Chair? No, that, that's fine. Yeah, this is, there's no, we're not taking, but we're, this is so, to get as much questions answered as possible about all the stuff going on. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, I've been listening into this entire meeting and I, I, I think I'm gonna be on a bit of a tangent. I don't think I'm gonna take up too much time, but um, Close the Workhouse is of incredible importance to me as it is to my constituents. And some of the testimony I've heard here today, especially from um, Mr. Carson is, is really concerning to me, especially with respect to 
Um, him thinking for some reason that detainees who have not yet been um, charged with being guilty or innocent, making three to five dollars a day doing um, menial work and lawn work, um, you're conversation about quote unquote females like being trained to do laundry and being allowed to hold their newborn babies. I mean, all of these things are um, an antiquated and archaic way of thinking. And it breaks my heart that that's what we've spent um, the most of this meeting dealing with. I mean, we need to start thinking about detainees in, in other ways. I haven't heard anyone talk about working um, together with the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council or the Circuit Attorney's Office or the judges to make better outcomes for our detainees. We should not, I mean, I, I love the, you know, break, baking bread program, but we shouldn't have detainees in St. Louis City Jails for so long that they are even, you know, uh, getting training in these things. It's, it's just absolutely absurd. And so, um, I don't know, I guess I just wanted to uh, voice my r real concern. Um, I'm, I'm, and, and actually I'm so angry and sad that I'm shaking. Um, we are just not doing this right. We're not looking at this from the right direction. We are not um, going to have the outcomes that we want if we continue to just put Band-Aids on problems and head in the trajectory that we have been for the last however many years. I don't even know how long. I'm 46 years old. Um, it's been at least the last 30 years that I'm aware of. So um, that's all I have to say. And I appreciate you uh, letting me take the time, Mr. Chair. Well, that's fine. And, and, you know, obviously I, I, I disagree that we don't, we don't have the option of saying, well, we'll just let you go next week. I have to say that, you know, uh, Mr. You know, Mr. Carson and 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 I I, I know Dan Ison's trying to do the best that he can. I, I don't. We just happen to be on such opposite sides on closing the workhouse in in a sense that um, <clears throat> I'm not. You know, they're there. We don't have a choice. It's not optional. We have to deal with it. I, I really feel that taking people, sending them to Kentucky, 160 inmates to satisfy, you know, that's 160 families that would have to go to Kentucky now to see their, their uh, uh, family members. We got 160 people that when trials do start up are going to have to be transported from Kentucky to St. Louis for their travels. I mean, this this whole thing is, you know, it's smoke and mirrors. You know, I'm not trying to be mean or rude. It's smoke and mirrors. We're taking a facility that's perfectly good, that the people to get to those pods and the ones that they were living in in the start with are the same pods that we're talking about putting them in as an overflow. You still got to go through the same front door if you're walking that direction to see them. I, I don't disagree, close the workhouse, but, but to sit there and say, no, this is a much more humane thing to do. These people are ordered in our custody. It's not a choice. We have to deal with it. So to say, gee, you know what? Uh, yeah, let's kill the let's get rid of the baking programs and all the different programs. We can just people keep people locked up in their cells doing nothing if you feel that's more humane. This the whole thing on this, I, I don't care about the buildings, fix them. I care about the people in the buildings. And my problem from day one on this is we're taking people out of what isn't a very pleasant place and putting them in something much, much worse. And what you're gonna find is you're gonna see a lot of buyer's remorse. Now, I, I, uh, I saw that uh, Adolfo Pruitt saying, Don, uh, Mr. Pruitt, do you have something you would like to say? Or 
anything. I mean, you're certainly welcome. Uh, if Reverend Gray is here, he's also certainly welcome. They're, they're part of the group that we toured that under the mayor's uh, plan there, you know, and, and we see a lot of problems, but we only toured, I've been in both, but seen both, but we toured CJC, we found 60 something problems in CJC. And so we're gonna take people out of one place and put them in something much worse. Mr. Pruitt, did you have some, something that you would like to add to or subtract to? Or? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'd love to ask the commissioner a few questions I'm curious about if that's okay with you, Mr. Chairman. It's absolutely okay with me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you answer uh, for Mr. Pruitt? He's the head of the NAACP and certainly concerned about people. Yes, yeah. thanks. Commissioner, have you read the task force that we put, the task force report we put together and the recommendations we made? Yes. And and have, have you, over at the CJG, can you tell us if any of those recommendations have been, uh, especially the critical ones, have been implemented at all? Uh, I, 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 I haven't... Um... Uh, seen all of the recommendations implemented at this time, no. It's, think, it's uh, so, so, so let me tell you how long I've been. Uh, uh, Dale Glass actually retired on June 1st. So I'm about 13 days into this. And, uh, but in the 13 days, I've already explained what I've done. Some people are happy about that. Some people are not. But yeah, we're, it's going to take a little time. But yeah, I read it when Dale Glass was the commissioner. Yes. So is it is it possible that you maybe can provide the chairman and Mr. Chairman, you can provide the task force members uh, if the chair if the commissioner can uh, do a uh, inventory of assessment on those recommendations we had in the report, which ones have been implemented and which ones have not, so we can have some idea as relates to status uh, and that's something we've been trying to get as a uh, task force and as a subcommittee of this committee for some time now and it, yeah, and, and so we, we would love to know just where things are if that's possible mr chair I, I i would i would ask that you provide that to us one of the things that we found was critical which would actually answer one of the things that uh, uh, C uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Isom was uh, a public safety director, I'm sorry. Isom was talking about one of the things when we, we had, they had 16 plus people in a cell that was a holding cell that is not meant you know, with one bathroom that's seen by everybody that's not held. But technically what we found through our you know, when, when you're talking about holding something for another jurisdiction, our understanding was we're only supposed to hold them for only up to 48 hours or two, you know, two days. And then we release them if they haven't picked them up. And only 24 hours if they haven't been charged. But yet we found people in there being held for weeks and weeks and weeks in, in, in a cell with no showers, no, I mean, it was inappropriate and really they shouldn't be in there to start with not for that amount of time you know uh, so so what mr Pruitt's asking with the the tell them what the critical i know was that that the cells the the locks um mr. Pruitt, you, you go ahead. yeah that was there was a number of things if we can get an update uh, assessment as it relates to what what has been addressed and when it's not be helpful and we talked about those holding cells but our understanding is that if they've been picked up on probation or parole violation, only the probation board of the state can ultimately decide what's going to happen with them or release them. Or if it's uh, uh, if that's on parole, if it's probation, only the judge who put them on probation through his order can they be released, which means that they're in, I guess, that tank or that holding cell, and we have them indefinitely. And my assumption is you cannot, I guess, transfer them or ship them out somewhere else. 
Is that is, is that not the case? No, put them in general population. But you were on the task force, so you would know that those are not our inmates. Uh, those yeah. are police inmates. Well, I mean, yeah, when that's I, what they belong to the police. I, no, I understand from a jurisdictional standpoint mm -hmm. who they belong to, but they're in your facility, and you're providing them all all everything as every aspect of their life, food, all of that. You're providing and responsible for them. Am I right or wrong? Uh, well, we provide them food, yeah, and because they're in the building, yes. But their custody is the is the police. I, I, no, I, I'm not, I'm not. I understand it. What I'm asking is that but we could they, not. I cannot let them go. I cannot right. do anything. I can't let them go on the street. I can't do any of that at all. <laughs> exactly. So and, and it'd be kind of. Uh, they used to give them bag meals. Um, you know, from the police department and all of that. So we thought they could get hot meals. So that's why we kind of uh, changed that to hot meals. But but it is a complicated situation because, yeah, like you said, everybody automatically assumes that we can do something with those yeah. those individuals. Yeah. So I'm saying, so you have them, but they're not also in the general population. So if you got 30 of them, they're not, in, they're not in our jurisdiction at all. The yeah, I'm saying, but they're in your building. So hold on. Yeah, they're in the building. They're, they're in your building. And uh, let me ask a question. Are you responsible for detainees that are held in your building, regardless of whose jurisdiction they're under or and, and what section of the building they're in? Are you responsible for the care of those detainees? Let me let me answer that. Um I'll, I'll answer that, Mr. Pruitt. Yeah, we're we're responsible for it. Okay. And so okay. what we're doing is, you know, we've we've changed the direction of that. Um, before we got here, and you understand it because you're on the task force, that there was this disagreement between whether or not those are police or corrections people, uh, and that's why they remained in those areas. Um, as uh, Commissioner Carson stated, uh, those people are being put into holding areas now, not just the open holding area, and thus is why we, we don't have 50 people sitting in there. So I know that was a concern of the task force, that's something we we're working on. And uh, as uh, Director Carson, uh, Commissioner Carson stated, that does take away some of our capacity, though, for actual detainees that are our responsibility. Mm -hmm. So when we have 40 people who are actually taking up cells, who are probation, parole, uh, um, other municipalities, that takes away from our capacity because technically, technically, Legally, they're not ours, but you're right. We are responsible for the care and custody of them while they're there, and we're doing that. Yeah, I agree. I, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Public Safety Director, I appreciate that yeah. <laughs> because I, 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 I know they are, and I'm just trying to figure if for some reason or another, if that number increases as relates to probation or parole violations, and that number, say, you get 50, say it goes up to 100, at any given period of time, I just want to make sure we understand clearly that we have them. We we don't. We can, there's nothing else we can do with them. And I thought what I got from the task force was that we are not allowed to put them in general population. And I'm just trying to figure out is that still the case? Because if that's the case, then I guess I'm trying to figure out what 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 are we doing in that? How do we do that and handle that in that situation? going forward, if there's a realistic answer at this point in time. If not, I understand. I'm just trying to get some assessment on that. So you can answer that later. The, my other question is this, and it's more, more critical one to, to you, Mr. D Director, or the commissioner. The conditions that exist at the workhouse, if, if those conditions become prevalent at the CJC, because those conditions at the workhouse is the is the impetus and the foundation for the lawsuit against the city and if those conditions become prevalent at the cjc and is it when is it even possible that those conditions can exist do they can exist in any way now is that possible they do and if they do do you have a contingency plan to deal with that or does the lawsuit now or do we anticipate a new lawsuit against the city for the conditions at the CJC, and we won't be able to close it. We can close the workhouse, 
But if those conditions be, become prevalent at the CJC, we can't close it. So I'm just trying to figure out, have, have we thought about that at all? And what, you know, what the possible contingency plan is. Uh, and if you don't have one now, uh, hopefully by me bringing it up, it's something that you take a look at. Because uh, I know that as we talk about the civilian oversight of corrections, those are some of the things we want to look at. And then the last question is, and like I say, if you don't have an answer now, it'd be great if you can share it with the chairman and we get back together. And that is, is that, uh, and to the commissioner, I guess more than anybody else, do you have a sense of what 21st or what we would call 22nd, uh, 22nd uh, century correction would look like? And are we in the position in, in our current facility to begin to uh, envision what corrections uh, moving ourselves to where we're dealing with corrections in the future versus dealing with it as, as it is now. I think uh, all the women of Grassi stated that uh, uh, that it is antiquated in, in some ways, and I'm not being negative. I'm just trying to understand that if we're going to have this futuristic look at, 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 at corrections reform, uh, criminal justice reform, and all these other things, Let's also look at how we create the correction facility and correction program for the future uh, uh, in this city. And I'm done, Mr. Chairman. So I, I would just, um, and I'll turn it over to Carson to talk about what the future looks like. But, um, you know, one, one of the issues is certainly um, maintaining the proper number of people in a facility. So we expect to do that. Uh, the other issue is, um, you know, making sure that we do the updates uh, on uh, the facility, the repairs, updating it to, um, you know, current standards. And so we're in the process of doing that, um, you know, working towards the proper staffing, um, merging the staffing so we have better staffing there. I think um, uh, Commissioner Carson talked about the programming that he's doing and working towards, um, you know, issues of recidivism and then in, in the mayor's um, you know, agenda, it is to work on, um, you know, things that would help in the area of recidivism. So um, I, I think on all those fronts, we, we certainly expect not to have the conditions that led to any <laughs> lawsuits. Uh, I mean, that would be our, our, certainly our goal is to, um, you know, manage the facility and do the operations that would not lead to uh, those types of things that have happened in the past. Um, but um, I will turn it over to uh, Direct, uh, Commissioner Carson to talk about, you know, 21st century uh, corrections. I, I will also say that, you know, you, th these are detainees that are not, you know, um, sentenced either. So, um, so while we do have them for a short period of time and we will, you know, work towards that, um, they are innocent really to prove guilty. Uh, in, in the in the state that they are with us. I agree. The, the, the City Justice Center was built in 2002. And this is 2021. So it's already outdated. And anybody that knows, you know, about any building <laughs> is, is the shelf life is, has been reached already. Um, so if you look at, um, if you look at sales, 66, like I was telling the director earlier today, um, no one person can supervise 66 maximum security offenders. Now, if you look at the sales at the county, there's 48 sales, which is closer to the 35 to 48 people that people can adequately supervise. So, so 66 Maximum security inmates requires two officers. The city's only staffed us for one officer. And, and the other thing is, you know, I, 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 you know I, I, re, I think that the city has to make a decision of what they want corrections to look like. You know, I mean, some people voice their frustration at re-entry concepts and community justice and restorative justice concepts, but they don't say anything to the judges or the circuit attorneys or anything like that, but 
Dr. Isom is talking to the circuit attorney when we think that someone should be moving right along, you know, so he's taking that responsibility on and, and, and in fact said he's going to start passing it on to me. So, um, so we, we are looking at trying to help the city, the city decide what, what, what to do. At this time, the, uh, the St. Louis uh, City uh, County Jail holds 1,400 people. You know, the St. Louis City Jail, we told you the numbers. So the jail is smaller and, and, it's, out, and it's antiquated. Uh, the AC is failing. Um, some of the alarm systems need to be replaced. Uh, some of the doorings uh, and lights, the lights, the total light systems inside the cells need to be replaced. So the city has to decide if you don't want a jail, it's fine. You know, don't have a jail. But if you're gonna have a jail, then you gotta put some money in it. You can't just tell the people that run the jail that you're dissatisfied that people are being arrested and placed in a jail. But when we do have the opportunity to uh, practice restorative justice, I mean, who in the community is teaching job skills? If you're concerned about jobs, there should be more opportunity for job skills. You know, everybody can't go to the urban league and maybe this person never thought about jobs. Maybe their entire family and their family's family uh, relied on public assistance and they never worked a job. And then all of a sudden, you know, you find out that the person uh, does want to work a job because they've been exposed and they may be able to go back and, and at least share that with the rest of their family. So I think that the city has to decide what kind of jail do you want? You, if you don't want a jail, the alderman can decide that and get rid of the jail. And not that, but why would you want more police, right? And you want crime reinforcement, but you don't want anybody arrested. Does that make sense, you know, uh, for, for that to happen? So my, my philosophy is very simple. You have to be able to fix the building or you don't want to fix the building. The, the city didn't give us money to fix the MSI. The federal people gave us money and we fixed MSI without the city's permission. So that's what happened. Now the city, this, this justice center needs fixing. If you ask me to be the acting commissioner, then you gotta help me fix it if you, if you wanna fix it. If you don't wanna fix it, then we have to be creative on how we, how we do things and fix things. But the, the locks need, uh, the, you know, the lights need replaced. The alarm systems need to be looked at. The, uh, the, the computer systems that operate the building need to be upgraded. Uh, the um, and 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 I, I was just advised that that we need some alarm systems uh, uh, that haven't been inspected for several years. You know, the unfortunate thing is, uh, 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 Mr. Pruitt, that there are many lawsuits that the city is facing, many at the Justice Center and the MSI. And in fact, two days ago, CJC just got served with another lawsuit. So uh, these lawsuits, you know, are pretty serious. They could cost the city millions of, of, of dollars, you know. Uh, uh, Mr. Green, yeah. Mr. Green, I had to, to interrupt you, but Mr. Chairman, as a member of this subcommittee, I think that based on the testimony I've heard so far from the commissioner and the conditions he described, I think maybe as we talk about this, this uh, corrections oversight, legislation, I think also we need to include asking the voters one way or another, do we want to address the issue as it relates to corrections and the facilities? Because if, if the issue is going to be that these people are innocent before proven guilty, and what he described, then there's no reason they should be subject to what he described if we're going to take the march up and say that these people need to be treated fairly and justly because they're innocent before proven guilty. And I close by saying this, Mr. Chairman, uh, because I want to make sure I'm very, I'm very clear on this statement. Police arrest, the circuit attorney office charges. And I believe our circuit attorney is not charging people who in most cases are innocent of the charges that come before them. I believe our circuit attorney is doing a great job as it relates to criminal justice reform. I do not believe she is allowing the police to submit inadequate evidence or whatever and simply charge people and take them to court. 
I think she's making the right charging decisions based on the evidence in front of her. And so I just want to make sure we're clear. Yes, they're innocent because they haven't went to trial and they have not been proven guilty. But I, I honestly believe that our circuit attorney is not making charging decisions that are frivolous and are not warranted. And I just want to make sure we're clear about that. And I appreciate the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to speak with both the Director of Public Safety and the Commissioner and to both of you. I appreciate you responding to my comments. And, and I will look. Uh, I will be looking at the task force report and keep you updated on that. I just haven't got uh, to that yet. And I agree that she, if somebody's there, she's looked at it, you know, because she, you know, the, the one thing I would say as far as money, I mean, certainly that COVID money that's coming could easily be related, you know, because and there's because there were no trials. The frustration level of the people in there is how a lot of that destruction happened and hurt. Certainly, I would feel that uh, a lot of money that's come to us on that compass money could go to fixing these things, which could easily be directly related to COVID, where people were in in there for a year, uh, you know, with, with no outside. I, I understand the frustration of the people in there. Um, so hopefully, you know, uh, uh, Director Isom and, and, and uh, hopefully we'll all work together to, to find the money. Uh, and like I said, I, I really think tying COVID to, to, to the windows being broke out certainly is an easy connection because I think that was just the hopelessness of the people that were in there that caused the frustration level to go so high that these things happen. Um, right, and just to, to be clear, you know, the things that um, Commissioner Carson uh, spoke about, uh, those are the things that we have in terms of making updates and repairs to CJC. Um, so, but he's right. I mean, we, we have to invest and it hasn't been invested in over many years, whether it's MSI or the Justice Center. So that is being done now. Uh, hopefully, um, when we get to the point where we have completely updated the Justice Center, um, monies will continue to be put into it to maintain it uh, for years to come, but um, that hadn't been done in the past. Well, the only, the only person I did not seem to get to was, uh, who had their hand up, was Alderwoman Pam Boyd, and I don't know if she left us. You know, the problem is getting this late in the day. Uh, people are picking up children and, you know, uh, um, I, I just seen uh, all the women rice uh, just popped in. If you want, if you get want something, if you can keep it somewhat quick, I'd appreciate it. Because these guys probably got real lives too at some point. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate this extensive hearing um, on the subject today. I think we've covered a lot of ground um, and I, I especially want to thank Mr. Pruitt for your vision that you're, you're discussing as far as what is the future of corrections in the city and how is it that we want to continue to move forward? Because I think, you know, part of the reason that we have even come to this point is because of the reform of the bail process um, and the way that we are, are releasing folks pre-trial. Um, we, are, we are caring for them. We are ensuring that they are showing up for trial, but we are releasing nonviolent folks before their trial so that we're not holding them in the first place. Um, and I think that is that is something that numerous lawsuits uh, came against the city for that the Supreme Court of Missouri told us we had to reform our process. And again, that's not corrections that's doing that. That's the judges and the prosecutor's office. Um, but because we've done that, we've gotten to this point where we have a much decreased population that we're holding is detained before trial in the first place. Um, so I think we're, we're on this path of changing the way that we view um, detainees before trial, the way that we are, are doing public safety. And this is one more step in that process. Um, and I, I do think, you know, we're, we're talking about facilities at MSI that are good for job training, are good for um, resource building and capacity. But if, 
if they're inmates at a medium security institute or they are detainees at a medium security institute that don't necessarily need to be held because they are nonviolent, then we, those resources need to be in the community where they can be living amongst their families and their communities and learning those skills. And we do have a lot of really great programs. I mean, the Employment Connection, you spoke about Urban League, um, and part of the whole idea here is to reallocate some of this money that we're spending on detaining people behind bars and to put it back into the community where we can get them the, those resources where they live, right? And so that's, that is the vision of this is that we're pulling the resources out of the bars and giving them to people where they are. Um, and so that's what I would, I would hope that we as a city continue to embrace is their, their violent they're violent folks. We have a violent crime problem. That is, that is different. If we had, we, if we had job training resources, if we had baking programs, if we had um, social services, counseling, all of those things available to the the violent detainees as well, or those deemed violent and held pretrial, then that you know, and those trials tend to take longer as well. So maybe those resources are better spent in this reimagining of how we do incarceration, which our maximum security facility does not allow for that right now. And I don't even know if. The Federal Bureau of Prisons, right, if, if those are even programs that can exist, but that those folks that are held for long trials because they are serious offenses, that's where those resources can be used. Um, but again, the, we're talking about different facilities. So how are we how are we continuing to invest in people? And that's where we've gotten to right now is reducing our population because we are allowing people back into the community as they await their trial. We are ensuring that they show up for a trial. Um, part of what the bail project did was connect folks with their court information and transportation and with their jobs so that they could make it back to trial when it was time. Um, but so we're moving, we're moving steadily along this process that I think is working. And I would just encourage the committee and um, thank you, Public Safety Director and Commissioner Carson, for all of your work in believing in that process. Um, and I'm I'm here to support that. I think we are on a right path as a city, and it's it's going to be some growing pains. This is a different way to do it than we've done. But if the way we've been doing things isn't working, then I'm I'm here to support change in the right direction. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak. That's right, and and. And I, I'm just going to ramp up mine, and I'm going to let Vice Chairman Boyd, who also had his hand up again. Um, but I still have to say that we're, we're closing a facility. We're going to jam people into a facility. And I, you know, I, I agree. I mean, we're keeping it open anyway. Even though we say we're closing it, we are actually going to keep it open now because. Um, we're just going to call it something different. We're going to call it the CJC Annex. So it's still going to be open. So I mean, my 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 argument was just shutting it down, and you know, it's not going to be repurposed because it can't be repurposed if it's an annex building. Um, my my issue from day one is I, I'd love to see no jails, but. I don't know if you were in the earlier part of this. We, we, we took 160 of those people in order to make it fit and moved them to Kentucky. They're in Kentucky. Their family can't, their family's not going to go to Kentucky to see them. When their trials come up, they're going to have to go from Kentucky back to St. Louis. If you think that's a better way to do business, we haven't done anything except this place. A lot of people making it extremely impossible for their families to see them. And again, if you think taking 160 people that also had city charges on them and moving them all the way to Kentucky is a good idea, then, then, then that's great. I mean, you know, and this isn't no disrespect to you, we have very different visions and a lot of the same visions. I, I, I would love to see, you know, uh, uh, programs, and I, I keep preaching the Big Brothers and Big Sisters program. I will brag on my big brother as well as Alderman Boyd's big brother. My big brother is in the Navy serving on the SS Harry Truman. And I honestly believe, and he will say that I made a big difference in his family, that, you know, that's why he is where he is. Alderman Boyd's big brother, our little brother in the Big Brothers program, I ran into him when he was helping me with a homeless guy 
who he happens to be a police officer who took him in his police car and helped them get into the uh, that center downtown. You know, reform it starts in a lot of different ways, one of which I encourage people every day, get involved in the Big Brothers and Big Sisters program. Reform starts with the kids in grade school. Reform isn't taking 160 people, sending them to Kentucky so that we can fit now more people into a jail. We're still going to overcrowd. And I will predict, and I hope I'm very wrong, but I am going to predict that the level of frustration in there as we're doing this, the, you know, uh, uh, off, uh, Mr. Carson's uh, stuff that he told us in the uh, uh, Ways and Means meeting that people are sleeping on the floor and that uh, it's overcrowded, that, that these cells that are meant for one day or 24 hours Eyewitness, as well as Mr. Pruitt, people being jammed in there, 16, 18 people in a cell that's meant just to hold a couple with one toilet. And this is what we're taking. We're going to take people and put them in there now. We're not taking people from a bad place and putting them somewhere better. We're taking them from a bad place and putting them something worse. And I don't see that as reform. And I'm sorry that we, we, we agree on a lot. And I respect you, and I know your heart and your passion. I get it. But what I am saying is, I've gone in there. Me and John Muhammad have gone in there. The commissioner can tell you, we've gone in and played basketball with, with the people in there. Now, we're taking them from somewhere that's not good and putting them in a very, very, very much worse place. And we're gonna overcrowd them and do it. We're taking employees and we're putting them in a facility that we haven't fixed the locks. Now we've put the employees in, in danger. I've never been, in, and I think Alderman Boyd has said the same thing, and we've just done the same. We're not opposed to closing the workhouse. Give us a real good plan. The plan they gave us, we didn't accept. I still don't accept. I don't think it's acceptable, unless you do somehow, that it's acceptable now that 160 people are now in Kentucky, in a jail in Kentucky. I don't see that as an acceptable plan. Having people jammed in wherever you can fit them into another place, I don't see that as an acceptable plan, but this is the plan we're going with. Uh, they have now decided to actually keep the workhouse open. They're gonna just name it the annex but it's still the same building. You can name it, you know, that whole arose by any other name thing. Um, you know, it's still gonna be what it is. I, I actually agree with, uh, 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 you know, I want to say Dan Heisman and not be respectful of your position or Dr. Dan, but I agree with them that in, 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 in with, with the, uh, uh, you know, the jail, you know, that, 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 you know, we do need to keep that facility open with the goal, with the goal to permanently close it. I agree that we need to find the money to fix, you know, but, but now the people that had the freedom to go outside don't have their freedom anymore. The, the people that had the freedom to go play basketball because they didn't have to be uh, escorted that it wasn't just like one person in the basketball there was a whole bunch of people that playing basketball and I was no good at it but it didn't matter you know but I'm not opposed to closing the workhouse I'm a closed I'm so opposed to what we're doing to the people in there we're taking them out of a bad situation and their families and made them much worse the NAACP is getting letters the union's getting letters, and uh, Mr. Carson had stated that he's getting phone calls from upset people in droves. Uh, just even during the one meeting, six people saying, you, you've displaced my family. You've sent people a hundred and I mean, hundreds of miles away in Kentucky. The, it, Carson, so if this, is, if this is what we're considering a better thing, 
then God bless you guys. I don't see this as a better thing. I'm also one that feels that Larry Rice's facility should be open. I don't see how displacing the homeless people out to the street, saying, well, his facility just, was, just wasn't clean enough, but the street will do a little better for him. Where when I was bringing people into City Hall when we were able to, when the young ladies were coming to me at night telling me that two of them in particular told me that they got raped while one girl had her teeth all knocked out because she resisted. But we're doing a good thing. We close Larry Rice, that'll teach them. I hate to be that passionate, and I'm sorry I am. I have all the respect in the world for you, you know, Annie, you know, you know that. And I know you're a very smart attorney, you're very passionate. But we're on different sides. We're on the same side and different sides all at the same time. I think what we're doing to those people is tragic. Um, you know what? I do see Alder Woman Boyd back, and she had her hand up earlier. I'm a, what I'd like to do is wrap up with Alder Woman Boyd. And, and first off, before I close, I do thank you, you know, Dr. Dan and Mr. Carson, because. Uh, you know, I thank you for not making excuses not to be here because you knew this was not going to be like a, a big hugging and love fest. Um, and, and I think that it's important that, that, you know, we get that out. I would also like, I know you won't let the media go in. I wish you would. But I do think that I'd like to put together and I sent something over uh, along with Mr. Pruitt and along with Reverend Gray, uh, you know, uh, and members of the Public Safety Committee or any of the aldermen that want to, I'd like them to go over and take a look, especially to see what we've done to improve uh, CJC. Um, anyway, but I, I'm gonna let, because I, I, I admit I will carry on and I, my ADD will, kick in big time and I'll be all over the place. What I think I'm gonna do is let all the women Boyd talk. I'm gonna let Vice Chairman Boyd uh, finish off and ramp us up. But I do wanna thank you guys for showing up. And I do have deep respect for both of you guys. You know, uh, and you know, one of the things in, in, in the car wash business that I was in, we had a very successful business because I, you know, my friends were the best ones to give me my criticism because they were the ones that I knew were not criticizing me because they disliked me. They were criticizing me because they feel that we could do a better job and it helped make me successful. And, and, and I 100% support that you're, you're gonna call it an annex I 100% support keeping that open and I will support permanently closing that facility when it's deemed appropriate that we can close it without hurting more people than we've already hurt. And, and I do, I pray and I seriously do every night, I say my night prayers, that everything works out for those people. But I do think you're gonna see more windows broke out because I think we're gonna cause a, a, a larger level of frustration and, and certainly you better keep that annex open. Otherwise, I don't know where we move them to. Okay. Anyway, God bless you guys. Uh, Alder, woman, Alder Woman Boyd and then uh, uh, Alder Men Boyd, if you can, I'm going to mute myself and you can close us out. I didn't, I didn't want anything. I wanted to thank them for coming. And then you can get up. Do you have any rear end left? Because I know y'all feel like y'all have been beat up, spit out, and chewed up. But I just want Jeff and Jeffrey and Dan to know that we care about you all and we know that you have a hard job and that you are not trying to cause havoc and uh, confusion. You're just trying to fix something. And so it was given to you to do I think Mr. Carson has done has done a fantastic job, and I can uh, relate to the machine that they have with the bakery because you know I told you I was jealous because my facility didn't have that, and so I know what it can produce. 
And I'm honored to hear that you are actually looking at rehabilitating the young men and women that are going into our system. But people need to understand that the federal prison environment is totally different from the workhouse. Is white collar crime, it's, it's no way that they're in the environment like the workhouse or like the justice center. And I think our, our systems are pretty good compared to others in other cities. But I just wanted to be clear because I think people, as uh, Alderman Boyd said, people keep sending out mixed messages. And when you're not educated and don't know and not aware, then you can't speak on it fluently. And so make sure people understand, like Jeffrey said, Dan Isom doesn't have a driver and Mr. Carson doesn't drive a Mercedes and Jeff Hines doesn't have a limo. You know, just make sure that we get that information out there correctly to residents in the community because they've lost hope. They feel like they're out here and nobody's listening to them. And it's a minority that's really trying to push for them. And it's people like us that saying, we hear you, we just trying to help fix it so you don't have to live like this. So I just wanted to thank you all very much for what you're doing and just hold your head up. You, you're not the bad boy. So I just want y'all to know, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Vice Chairman Boyd. Uh, You're very welcome. Thank you. You know, I, I, what I will say, and I, I really appreciate that, is that um, as we uh, have heard here today, um, there are a lot of different perspectives on this issue. Um, what we do know is that um, there has been a community groundswell to close the workhouse. Um, and even uh, the board at least voted for a plan to do that. Um, and the mayor has decided that we will do that. And um, Commissioner Carson and I are putting a plan in place uh, and we are taking into consideration uh, detainees, employees, uh, all of those factors, the repairs that need to be done, uh, the repairs that uh, should have been done long time ago. Um, and um, we, we are listening to you all and to everyone's concerns, trying to make contingency plans. So we're we're trying to incorporate all the different concerns that people have uh, into what is a challenging process, uh, moving one facility into another, uh, recovering from a COVID uh, issue and, and all the other things, uh, reforms that we're trying to make. And so, um, well, I, I certainly appreciate everyone's concerns and we, we will take those into consideration. Um, but I, I think um, the fact that we are exploring contingency and the ability to adjust um, shows you that um, we're, we're trying to take everything into consideration. And ultimately, you know, if in fact everything had been done uh, at the CJC, to update it over the years, we would have had no problem moving everybody into the Justice Center. So I just want that to be clear, that if everything had been done over the past 25 years to update the Justice Center, we would have no problem with the capacity of putting people into the Justice Center. And furthermore, the federal detainees were uh, a deal to make money to invest into uh, updating the system because the monies were not allocated as uh, Mr. Carson said. So I, I appreciate every, everything everybody has said. We, we certainly take it to heart and to consideration as, as we move forward um, with trying to accomplish this. Okay, I wanna say that um, we're certainly all in this together. Um, uh, again, uh, Jeffrey Carson, I wanna thank you for all your service you know, that you have given. Um, Sometimes it goes unnoticed because of the, all the narrative about all the negative stuff. And it goes back to, you know, you hear 10% of the negative things, but 90% of, you know, the issue is really pretty good. Um, and, and Dr. Isom, you know, I've 
known you for the whole 18 years. I've been autumn. He was my first captain out there where we've always had a great relationship. Um, I, I've never had a reason to question your integrity. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to be cautiously optimistic that this can work out under your leadership. And that's just being blunt, honest. And, you know, I've never changed. I've always been honest with you and upfront with you. Um, I want to also say that, you know, it, it requires everybody in that ecosystem to work together to make this shift that's been asked for. Um, Jeff, I see Jeff came back. I did have a question of Jeff Hines earlier. And uh, Jeff, if you unmute yourself, I want to ask, yes, sir. when was the last time you took a visit to the Justice Center or MSI as a union representative? Me, myself, it's been a bit. How about um, anybody? I have an area steward named Jennifer Adams who goes there frequently. Okay. Have we actually done a complete tour? It's been a little while. Okay. And the reason I bring that up is because if we really want to make this work, you know, all the stakeholders, Dr. Isom, really need to be involved. Um, you know, I know from <clears throat> Hans, you know, position that they represent city employees, which I really want to support our city employees. Um, they, he needs to know that what's being told by the employees to him is true. And it's Absolutely. not made up. Just like I asked you, is this true? There been, I, don't, I don't like rumors. You know, and so I think if we're going to make this plan work that you're trying to put together, it really needs to involve conversations with the unions that represent our city employees, because they have to be important. They need to feel like we care about them. And so I just want to encourage you to, to have more conversation with the union representatives. And I'm so ignorant to, you know, who all the unions represent sometimes. I, I don't know if the carpenters represent all of them or there's other pieces that represent other employees within that system. But I just want to say all stakeholders matter. The board of aldermen matters. And that's why you're finding a lot of heat from the board of aldermen, because, you know, some of us are feeling like, you know, you're going to treat us if we don't matter and just do what you want to do. And, and that's not right. And so you're going to always get pushback from that because you know, at the end of the day, the city has an obligation to house these detainees. We are not fishing in a bucket for them and say, hey, we need to house you. That's the courts. It's it, 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 city. It, it, it's mostly the uh, circuit attorney's office that's making a decision on whether or not they're going to take a case and they'd be incarcerated. And then it's whoever the judges that are deciding on whether you know they get bail or not. That's not on the city. But this narrative that's been created is it's the city is this big, ugly entity, and we don't care about people. And, and that's just so unfair from the groups that want to close the workhouse. I'm just going to call it out like it is. It's not 100% on the city. Now, we do have a responsibility to make sure that they're not housed in unhumane conditions. And again, I have not found that they have been in quote unquote unhumane conditions. If you grew up in the hood, like I have, and so many people, my all of my colleagues, um, you know what the experience is of growing up with infestation. You know, it, it was like, it was like almost like normal. I mean, if you went to school and you didn't know anybody that had roaches or mice, it was like, oh God, where you live? You know, you just exterminated, you dealt with it and, and you, you moved on. But it's not like something that we've never heard of before. And I have just not, I, you, you see one or two roaches, okay, so let's deal with that. But, you know, one thing I definitely would not support is if you're waking up in the middle of the night and it was all over your head and blankets and all that kind of stuff and mice is just jumping off you and biting you in there. I, I mean, that's deplorable. That's what's deplorable to me. But when you don't have the context of really understanding this environment because you grew up privileged, you just don't understand and you don't get, you, you cannot empathize with me and Pam Boyd and so many other my colleagues if you don't have those life experiences. You can only sympathize and then you take your privilege and decide to exercise it upon people who really understand what's going on as if they don't which becomes insulting. And then you get people that are resistant to this change. And I think we're moving closer toward embracing this change. But I think, we, again, we have to just continue to, 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 to figure out how to do it in the most responsible way with the least past of resistance so that we all win. So I just want to say that because I really personally feel like we're moving 
passed a few weeks ago. I feel good about it, you know, but I feel good about it because more of the truth is coming out. We cannot govern on a lie. It's not fair. It's not right. It's not just, just to get your way. And so with that, I'm going to call the Public Safety Committee adjourned for today, June 15th. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you.